escape from reality. In two of my most popular videos, I refuse to talk about mobile games in depth. For one, they're harder to record on a widescreen format. Secondly, a lot of them are just vessels for really expensive microtransactions or ads that spam you every 12 seconds for games that don't exist. And thirdly, I just don't play a lot of mobile games. Another popular thing I try to stay away from is the YouTube homepage. Almost all new videos and creators I find, I find through recommendations, either from friends or on the little sidebar as I'm already watching a video. There's almost never anything of interest to me on the homepage to justify me going there, and when I do find something I like, it's because it's a video I've already watched and it's being recommended to me again for no apparent reason. Against my better judgment, I was scrolling through on my phone one day and I found YouTube Playables. I had no idea this was a thing, I never saw anything, anywhere, or anyone talking about this being added. It seems like they've only been around since May, some people don't have it, some people do. I genuinely don't care enough to google anything super about it because I want to talk about the games. As of right now, there are over 90 games available, you can play them all right now, you don't need to download anything if you already have the YouTube app, which is really nice for me because my phone is completely filled with me opening shards in Raid Shadow Legends. While working, I often have a few minutes here or there, maybe a quick render to test something, or I need a snack and I don't want to work while eating, or I just need to look away from my editing screen for a few minutes to reset my brain and solve a problem I have. And the idea of having a bunch of games quick to open and super accessible on both desktop and my phone that syncs back and forth automatically is kind of a cool idea. It reminds me a lot of what I used to do with Flash games before those didn't feel too good, Mr. Stark. But beyond that, I don't really have a ton to say about it because I haven't played any of these playables. I feel like I just fell asleep for a few years and missed that a lot of streaming services have games now. Like, did you know Netflix has games too? Let's, let's cover that next video, not, not this one. But as I said, there are over 90 games so far, at least at the time of recording this. They've added a few since I actually started writing this and it's only been a few weeks. I don't know if they intend to keep adding more, if the games are gonna get more complicated or if they're all gonna be kind of mobile game style things. And maybe there's a hidden gem or two. Maybe there's something good buried deep within here, or maybe it's a complete waste of time to even look at these. But let's find out together. So join me on this journey to see if YouTube playables are even worth playing. Before we get started, whilst I was partway through making this video, someone informed me of another creator named Mad Main Pick. No, sorry, Madman Epic, and they had created something very similar, and I'm sure other people have as well. It's kind of a new thing, so maybe a bunch of people are jumping on and talking about it. I just want to say for the record, I have not watched their video, I have not watched any other video about playables, and I don't intend to either because I want to form my own opinions, and I don't know how they formatted their video exactly, so feel free to go check out that video after this video, or you can do it now, but only if you promise to come back afterwards. It's probably going to be a lot shorter than mine because I tend to ramble a lot. For this video, I'm just going to tackle the games in alphabetical order, give you a quick mechanical breakdown, tell you how I feel about them, and we'll just hammer this out one by one. I'm not going to explain how every game works because some of them are like chess or solitaire, but I'll do a brief thought when we hit those games. And also, apologies in advance for the aspect ratio. Some of these games convert to full screen when you're on computer, others do not. Some of them were clearly intended just to be mobile games that were very quickly rushed and ported over to desktop, and so you see a lot of things you're not really supposed to see. This is a huge reason why I don't cover a lot of mobile games. In my opinion, there's just no way to make it look good, but I'm just going to use the full screen visual that each game gave me when I went full screen on my computer. So that's what you get, I'm sorry. 8-Ball Billiards Classic. It's 8-Ball Pool. It plays exactly like how you think it does. It's not quite the same as the Facebook Messenger pool that's been around for what feels like forever and now has a second life as a meme. 
but it's still very instinctive. You can figure out how to play very quickly, you can even turn off the guidelines if you want to do so, and you can set the computer's difficulty on a level from 1 to 5, in which case they go for some crazy angled shots and pretty much nail it every single time. Honestly, as basic as it is, if I wanted to play a game of pool and I didn't know where to go and didn't want to look around or didn't want to challenge somebody on Facebook, this is very easy to find and it scratches the itch. 99 Balls 3D I used to play an app very similar to this during my breaks at work and I can't express how much of a disappointment this version is. You control a launcher of balls at the bottom of the screen and every turn a random number of tiles, we'll call them, drop from the ceiling. These tiles get bigger every turn and if a tile hits the floor, the run is over. Throughout the run you can collect more balls which are pretty necessary and stars which just unlock different skins. The physics in this version sucks. First off, the controls are not natural. You can see me struggling in every piece of footage I got. It just doesn't follow your mouse at all, it'll start in a random direction and you kinda have to feel it out. But not like it's a part of the challenge, it's genuinely just not fun to play with. I played it on mobile too just to see if it got better, and it didn't. Secondly, it's almost impossible to do what you actually want to do. In the version I played, the tiles were square, meaning you could bounce the balls off the sides and have them get caught up in the top of the playing area, and it felt really cool when you pulled that off because you were making a ton of progress with one go. But these circles are so finicky, and sometimes even the lines that dictate where things are going to go are just wrong. They almost never bounce the way you want them to. You never get that really satisfying back and forth where you just take out a huge section at once. Sometimes I'll try to aim so I can get it back and forth and it'll hit the balls and go up. And literally the balls won't even make it to the circles, which just tells me there's some sort of physics problem here because there's no way I should be going down before reaching the top or at least hitting something first. Ultimately, it's a pain, and like I said, I tried it on mobile too just because I had a little bit of hope, and it's actually kind of worse. Honestly, even if they didn't change the circles to squares and just made it so the line would follow your cursor, because literally why doesn't it follow your cursor, it would be 10 times more enjoyable. But as it stands right now, I can't play this. It's just a tease of a better version, and there are a lot out there. Adorable Home Adorable Home is a game where you need to collect love in order to do things. You customize your home, take pictures, feed the animals, make meals for your partner. Everything gets you love or costs you love, but everything is also on a timer and the timers are very long to start. Your partner goes to work, you feed the cat, pet the cat, cut the nails, bathe the cat, then suddenly there is nothing you can do for at least an hour. Eventually the timer will pass, you get to do everything again. And then it's going to take a day or two before you can do more, which then gets you love faster. Damn, your love is not enough. I... I felt that, man. Sometimes it, uh... Sometimes it really isn't enough. It's a very cute game. I know exactly what they were going for, and the cozy vibes are off the charts. It's just one of those idle checking games that you really only have to play once every two or three hours and it kind of boosts the app playtime because it says, look how many times people play this game in one day. I like the art. I like how unapologetically inclusive it is. You can choose a same sex partner and I played during Pride Month so there was a ton of really cool exclusive stuff for that. I just think the game is so severely hindered by how slow the beginning is because after five minutes you have to stop for at least two hours before you can do anything else. There's nothing to interact with, even if there was just a mini game that gives you very, very little love, but something that people could do if they wanted to grind and make a noticeable progress on day one would have been really nice. But hey, if you see love as nothing but a game and want to have the most love out of anyone, then maybe this is for you. Alien Shooter Alien Shooter is one of the Galaga inspired shooters where the ship follows your mouse and you have to avoid oncoming hits. It's a very instantly familiar formula. This one seems to have a place for microtransactions, but they've been removed for YouTube. So I imagine there's a fuller version out there where you can spend money if you so desire to do so. Throughout the game, you'll have little pickups that make your ammo either more powerful or more shots per shot. 
The other pickups will actually be ship types. In this game, you start off with three ships and two more that can be unlocked later. And the only way to change ships is to come across them in gameplay. So while you have a screen where you can upgrade the power of your ammo or bullet level, you may have to decide very quickly on the fly if you only want to upgrade one type of ship or not, or you risk putting your money into a ship that you may not get when you need it the most. There are also other things you need to upgrade, things called Evolve Stones, and these are just unlocked by playing through the game regularly. Another pickup you can get is this weird S symbol, which gives you a maxed out version of your ship, which will help you clear out waves like it's nothing. But be warned, it is one hit and you lose the level, even if you have this upgraded ship. There may be exceptions to that. There are some power-ups on the login rewards, but I, I don't know what any of them do. I didn't play long enough to get any of the login rewards. There are two sections on this map, a campaign, which you collect stars and occasionally have boss fights, and then just a boss section, which you can use after you've beaten them once. The game uses energy for every encounter, which I absolutely hate in a game like this, because why make me stop playing if I want to play? But obviously it's profitable enough for versions of the game where you can pay for energy, or else they wouldn't be doing it. I know Adorable Home has a lot of timers, but that's a mechanic. It's a type of game where you don't do much of anything and you log in every hour to do your stuff then leave. Here, these energy meters are just my least favorite thing and a huge reason why I try not to play mobile games to begin with, unless it's a game where the energy actually makes sense and contributes to the gameplay and its challenges versus this where you just have to stop playing sometimes. In all fairness though, during the 30 minutes I played, it never became an issue. You gain one energy every 30 seconds and most maps just require five. I do wonder if perhaps it's maybe a little bit sped up for the YouTube version since there's no microtransactions to compensate. For every campaign you beat, you'll get a star. And once you get enough stars, you can go back and play the earlier ones in harder difficulty. It's not like the maps have details, you're in space, so I imagine it just makes the same waves harder, and ideally you'd be upgrading your ships so it all balances out. The bosses also require 5 energy, but have a drop rate for gems, which gems can be used to buy coins, at least I think. I actually don't hate it. I don't really love these kind of games, so I don't naturally gravitate towards them and they do start to hurt my hand after holding down click and dragging the ship back and forth after a while, but I really enjoy the mechanic of not being able to change ships on the fly and only being able to do it with a pickup. It gives the game some cool strategy, especially when it comes to how you want to upgrade everything. If I keep playing, I'm going to start to see laser ships in my sleep. A maze. A maze is a game where you control the ball and have to highlight all of the squares to beat the level. There's been dozens of flash games that play exactly like this maybe i've actually played this version before on flash it's very possible it's very intuitive you can tell what you have to do by looking at it and this version feels fine there has never been a single point in my entire life where i've actively said i want to play this game but if i did this version would suffice the levels are pretty strange sometimes you'll jump from one that's actually got a little bit of difficulty to it to one that's just for fun that has a cool pattern and is somewhat r slash oddly satisfying to do so it doesn't really get progressively harder although occasionally you will just get stuck on a level because you're just not thinking clearly it also has game modes you'll notice the button is clearly made for mobile devices and sometimes it straight up covers part of the map which is really minor but kind of annoying They've got two other game types. One is just limited moves, so you only have so many moves to fill the board, which if you're a puzzle person is way more appealing. And then Time Rush, which is more my style. I actually enjoy doing the time stuff because the game isn't too hard on its own, so it adds a little bit of panic to the game. Overall, it's not the hardest thing I've ever played. It's not the most exciting, but it does exactly what it says on the box. Angry Bird Showdown. This probably won't come as a shock to you if you've ever listened to anything I've said ever, but I've never played any Angry Birds game in my life. It's right up there with Among Us, World of Warcraft, and whatever other really popular game you're thinking of right now. 
Angry Bird Showdown is a 1v1 game where you're paired up with another player who, by the way, is a bot. YouTube does not have any sort of online functionality when it comes to 1v1 games, so it's always going to be a bot. And you have to hit all of their pigs before they hit yours. The maps are laid out in such a way where it's quite literally impossible to hit enemy pigs without hitting your own, so you can't have a perfect game. I don't know why you would do that because it takes so much fun out of it for me. There are power-ups to protect your pigs or you can plant TNT, and every turn you get three random birds that you can't pick and they all do things. I'm going to assume that had I played Angry Birds before, I would be familiar with some of these abilities to an extent. Perhaps the original game has them, but this game doesn't tell me anything about their abilities or what they do, so I just had to guess at first. There is a ton of games like this. This is a formula that's been around for 20 years. It's not really special in the modern era, and I get the feeling that this game is probably pretty old. And just due to not being able to have a perfect game because of the placement of the pigs, it personally, it ruins it for me. That being said, I would confidently bet that someone's grandmother has played this like 500 times already and thinks she's playing against real people every single time. Basketball Fervor. It's just a game where you shoot a basketball into a hoop. There's nothing more to it. It doesn't feel great, but it doesn't feel awful either. It takes a while to get used to the feeling for sure, but after two minutes you'll realize that there's really nothing to do or any sort of goal to achieve. Maybe that sounds harsh, I know, it's just a basic app, and I would guess that it's probably at least 15 years old, but with nothing to do, it's just a number that goes up. Which, yeah, I know I'm the clicker video guy, I should be more sympathetic towards it, but there's just not enough for you to play for. You can get silver and bronze basketballs that multiply your points, or sports drinks to make the net bigger. The rewards for getting points is just more rewards to get more points to unlock the same rewards, so you've seen the whole game loop after two minutes. The net starts to move after a while and you can get these coins to unlock skins so maybe that can be your goal, but I think that playing this for more than 5 minutes would drive me genuinely insane. If this video gets 200,000 likes, it's not going to, I will do a 24 hour livestream of me playing just this and nothing else. I'm kidding. I'm not. Maybe if I was challenging a friend and we were competing to see who could get a high score, that could be kind of fun, but... I think if I recommended to someone that we should do this, they'd probably stop being friends with me pretty quick. If you're looking for a game where you flick a basketball in the hoop and do literally nothing else, then hey, this is your game, but otherwise, I'd say I'd probably pass. Get it? Pass. Like a basketball, like you pass the ball in a game of basketball. You see, where you really break down the structure of the joke, you'll find it's actually a very clever social comedy. Bazooka Boy. Another basic pull back and shoot game, which is kind of crazy how many we've already had. All you have to do is shoot the red guys and blow them up to win. You have three shots, you get extra money for doing it all in one go, which is kind of funny because there's no replay options, so if you're trying to go for all of them in one shot and accidentally mess it up and do it in two, you can't go back and redo it. Also, there's nothing to spend money on. The game just goes on for 50 levels, it takes less than 15 minutes, and then the game is over. It's possible the app has more to offer, maybe in terms of skins or a microtransaction which would feel very unnecessary, but as it stands, it's very lackluster and doesn't present too many challenges. That being said, You Are Failed is the hardest line I have ever read in any media, game, movie, book, TV, anything. It's so relentless, cuts you right to the core. It's the most real thing I've ever read in my entire life. Straight up, I wanted to quit YouTube after seeing this. No matter what, no matter how hard you try, you are failed. Block Drop. Block Drop is a Tetris style game where you have three tiles and you need to place them on the board. You can't rotate anything, which is a part of the challenge, and it's not just traditional Tetris shapes, but sometimes bigger or longer or shorter too. Should you get stuck, you have three things to help you out. You can hold a piece for later, use a bomb to clear a 3x3 grid, or redraw and get a new set of three pieces. Holding does work, but if you only have one piece left and can't place it, 
you can't hold it and get a new set. So keep that in mind. You have to actively use it before you think you're gonna get stuck. You can use the other two power-ups whenever, but if you get stuck and can't place anything, the game will let you use one as a way to get out of that, unlike the holding space. You also can't swap pieces out of your hold, so again, if you want to use the hold space to get out of a jam, you have to do it before. And if you have one piece left and nowhere to put it and an empty hold space, well, too bad. Scoring works like how you'd think. Once a line is full, it gets cleared, it disappears, and you get points. More points if you clear more than one line in a row. Also, after a while, I think maybe 500 points, these shiny blocks will appear, and they have to be cleared twice, which is extremely unnecessary because the game is hard enough. It's hard enough. You don't need to make it harder. This is the first game in YouTube playables that I believe adds real value to the concept. Now, let's be honest, we're not paying for any of these, so it's not like we can say it's a waste of money or anything. And I'm sure YouTube acquired the rights to a lot of old apps really cheap as an incentive to make more people go on the website, even though most people my generation already have YouTube open 24 seven. This is the first game that I find myself actually going back to to play. It's a fun, challenging game. The gameplay requires a bit more thinking than just swiping into a hoop and you want to see how far you can go. While there isn't a reward or anything, if the base concept of gameplay is interesting enough, in this case a fun puzzler that plays off the familiarity of another game, then people will come back to keep playing and beat their high score with no other incentive. And this game is really the first one out of this bunch that I think is worth doing that. Brainout. Brainout is a, don't, don't call me sweetie, Brainout is a mind teaser app where everything is a riddle. It's like if the impossible quiz wasn't funny, but also kind of snarky. Sometimes it's just as simple as spotting the difference, or sometimes moving something out of the way to find the real answer. Sometimes the answer is hidden in the text, which is dumb because then sometimes you get a question like this, and clearly the 8 is also in the title, so why can't I just click on the 8? If it worked once, why doesn't it work again? Some of them are fine, you generally do a lot of clicking around, sometimes you're looking for a riddle aspect when the answer is actually obvious and it just wants you to do whatever dumb thing it's asking. And then there's a lot that are just straight up math, which isn't very fun. Luckily, if you get stuck, you get hints. I can use one here to help and, oh, that's just, that's, that's just the answer. That's not a hint. That's, that's just the, the answer. What I love too is that if you try to skip a question, it costs you two hints, but the hints are just the answer. So the big problem is that there's no real consistency. If you use a hint, you just end up face palming because it's something that not only you weren't trying to do, you actively dismissed because it goes back and forth between here's a riddle and literally just count how many things there are. This isn't something worth playing even once, let alone coming back to. And I'm not saying I would do this, but if I happen to be around someone intoxicated and I wanted to mess with them, I might tell them to play this. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not saying I would do it. Maybe someone should do it. Bubble Pop Star. It's Puzzle Bubble, AKA Bust a Move. I don't know why the game was called Bust a Move, but they do be busting some moves. Basically, you have to shoot the bubbles into the other bubbles to pop them, and bubbles add on top of each other if they're not the same color, but if three in a row connect, they pop, and any pieces below them will also fall. The further you go, you get special types of bubbles, like stone or these weird fairy ones, which actually make the game easier. And as you get more score, you get rockets and lasers and black holes. The game gives you so many power-ups the further that you go, it actually becomes easier as you play. I have three gripes with the game. Number one, no colorblind mode. I will complain about any color-based game that doesn't have one until the end of my goddamn life. Number two, there are 2,000 levels in this game, which is great if you enjoy it, but I also think that just an endless randomly generated mode just to see how far you can go would be way more fun than doing these levels over and over again because they don't seem to change or be all that difficult. My third thing, and this is maybe a bit of a weird one that's a little bit nitpicky, 
is that the original bust move used to anger me to no end because it was hard to tell where your bubbles were going to land when you tried to bounce them off of walls or if they were going to land just a little bit off from where you wanted to because you couldn't perfectly aim. I think perhaps the later ones added a line so you could tell, but the version that I grew up with, it's not there. I don't blame the game for being on a grid rather than a smooth turn. It's probably a lot easier to do that than to have them auto lock in on a spot where they land or even more so just stick where they land and having to build off of that. That being said, the precise aiming takes out so much of the challenge of the game. I know this isn't bust a move the app, but let's be real, we know what this game is. It becomes more of a puzzle challenge than a skill challenge, but it also is a very easy puzzle because you know if the shot is going to make it through the gap rather than just hoping you can aim the bounce right. And while that's nice, it just makes everything feel a little bit too easy, like you're just going through the motions that the game has set out for you. I played about 25 levels out of 2000, and while I do think the game is one of the better ones we've seen so far, and I imagine that maybe around level 500 it's got some pretty good challenge to it, I just don't ever see myself playing for that long to get there. Cannonballs 3D Cannonballs 3D is a shooter where you have to destroy the stack of wooden blocks or metal cylinders or glass panes in front of you. You have a certain amount of shots per layout, and if you run out, you get sent back to the beginning of a stretch of level. At the end of every stretch, you get a cool fun map where you just have unlimited shots and it's just fun to watch everything fall down. As you progress, you'll get dynamite to blow up and moving boards and I'm sure other things if you go farther than I did. You also have a bomb icon in the corner that after a certain amount of points starts pulsing and you can use it to either get more shots at the end of a map or if you just use it on a map, then the shots explode on impact. The only downside is that if you use it once to make it past the level and then fail on the next one, you won't have it when you get back. Overall, it feels very good. It's very smooth, at least on PC. There is a point system which doesn't make sense because if you fail a level, then you reset the points, but because you're always on harder maps, you're not really starting from the beginning. So the point thing doesn't make a lot of sense. The game seems to balance this pretty well, so that you're still getting points for knocking things over, but not going crazy beyond your older scores, but honestly, I feel like the score is kind of just completely unnecessary and doesn't really add anything to the game. The levels are enough to just keep playing. The physics makes sense, there's a good challenge to it. I'll never play it again, but I also played it longer than I was expecting to. Cards of the Undead Cards of the Undead is another game that would go in the top tier if this was a tier list video because it isn't because... Damn, why didn't I think about doing a tier list? You play as a character on a grid of nine. You can move one square in any direction, not diagonal, and the goal of the game is just to stay alive as long as you can. Your character has a health number and an armor number, and when you move into a space with a zombie, it takes the difference out of those numbers, armor being first. So if you have 2 armor and 10 health and attack a zombie with the number 4, you'll end up with 0 armor and 8 health. Along the way, there are also coins which can be used to buy items before the game starts, or if you end with enough coins, they can be used to buy more characters, of which there are 5 in total. There are also armor pickups, XP, which lets you increase your max armor or health or skill cooldowns, traps that can damage or poison you, dumpsters that have mystery items, vaults that the only way to open is to remember the four or five digit code as it flashes right in front of you. And then of course there's zombies, food, armor, and coins. The objective of the game is to stay alive as long as you can and also collect as many coins as you can to unlock the other characters, although the game does keep track of your max level up and kills if that's something you want to go for as well. I like that the game has new characters with varying abilities, it gives you something to play for and to try. I'm not sure the game would hold up a ton by the time you unlocked the last character, but I'm going to guess if you made it that far, you're probably a big enough fan of the game that you could just keep playing for personal high score anyways. I won't go over every character because I didn't have enough time to unlock them all, but this is another game I've come back to a few times. It's a good combination of strategy and luck, so anytime you lose a run, you always feel like you could do just a little bit better with more focus and planning. 
And that's a good recipe for a game that doesn't really have an ending. Carom Clash. Based off the Indian game Carom, just imagine billiards but with a different flavor. You have a disc and your opponent has a disc, and you take turns shooting your discs at pucks to get them in the holes in the corner. Similar rules to pool apply, if you sink one you get another go, if you foul by sinking your shooting disc then one puck comes out and it's your opponent's turn. There are three game types, disc pool which is just sink your colored pucks, carom which is the same but there's a red puck that needs to be potted before the game is over so it can't be the last puck and you have to cover it by shooting another puck on top of it after you sink it or it comes back into play although i had one where my opponent sank it didn't cover it and it never came back but because it was sunk by the time i potted all my pucks i won which i don't know if there's a technical rule behind that or not and then there's freestyle which is my personal favorite because it's just sink as many as you can hit the target score red being 50 points your color which can vary with different skins being 20 and black being 10. you can unlock different strikers and stones which i think i've been calling discs and pucks but honestly they're all kind of the same thing circular round thing that you hit things with some of the different skins for the stones are a little bit dark so i like to stick to the brighter ones especially if you're playing freestyle so you can easily tell them apart the strikers actually have an effect on the game they have categories in force aim and time and you can also upgrade ones you've already bought i'd say the biggest downside is that upgrading your disc and buying new ones and betting money on games all comes from the same place so it kind of incentivizes you not to upgrade anything because you just can't bet as much in games and it'll take you longer to buy new ones and i'm also not quite sure there's a huge difference between strikers not one that i can tell anyways but hey i like my stuff to look cool honestly i find this one more fun than the pool one maybe that's just because it's a little more chaotic i can definitely see myself coming back to this every now and then and this one's pretty satisfying just to play a freestyle game where you don't have to focus too hard on which puck you're hitting just have a time and shoot away chess classic it's chess i mean i can't imagine chess apps are limited in supply but if you don't want to download something for it then sure play chess i also think if you're playing on a computer then perhaps you would rather play against somebody else online since there's so many options to do so but if you're just looking to maybe practice against an ai then this would technically suffice it's not broken the rules work there is an undo button that lets you have unlimited undo so if going back into your games and trying to find your mistakes is something that you're into so you can learn and get better i guess that's kind of nice ultimately though it's just chess the pieces move the way they're supposed to the ai plays chess against you you can't really ask for much more than that collect them all a game where you combine three colors to pop bubbles and win unfortunately completely unplayable I am colorblind, as I try to mention in every single video, and this just isn't playable to me whatsoever. What's worse is the game has skins, one is called Honeycomb, which uses shapes and colors, so it's literally the only way I could play this game, but it costs an astronomical amount of gold to buy. You probably can't appreciate this if you're not colorblind like me, but it's actually outstanding how every skin in this game manages to have at least two of the five colors be somewhat similar enough. It's truly incredible. It doesn't make the game impossible to play, but it does mean I'm gonna miss a lot of things I otherwise wouldn't if the colors were all very different from each other. Which, by the way, doesn't take away from the experience of people who can see a full spectrum of color. Games have multiple colors that are easy to distinguish all the time. This isn't a new concept. And it's just crazy to me that a game focused on color doesn't have this. The game itself is pretty brainless and something I would play for fun if I had two minutes to kill maybe. The pictures of people's faces popping up when you beat their score is genuinely hilarious. Even funnier when you realize none of them are real people, they're all just kind of random AI faces. It's a game that could be cool, but until color based games realize that colorblind people can't play their games without some sort of filter or setting, there's nothing I can do. So thank goodness the next four games all start with the word color. Color Burst 3D. The colors aren't actually too bad on this one, but the motion sickness is. If there's two things I mention in every video, it's that I'm colorblind and that I have motion sickness. I made it three minutes before I had to stop. 
uh, hit the color with the other color. You get it. I gotta, I gotta stop. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna throw up if I have to keep looking at this. Color match. Most of us have probably seen that one dude on TikTok and YouTube shorts that mixes colors and it's basically that, but it's a game. Except there's no points or scores and it just goes on forever. And sometimes Pickle Rick is here. I've never seen a single episode of this show, but this, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Again, I'm colorblind, but you don't have to get it perfect. And I have a good enough knowledge about color theory because I had to study to kind of compensate and I could kind of just guess and get a lot of these right. Some of these I can even tell are way off, but it's very generous in its percentages. The game will also kind of hint to you when you're close because the compare button will flash a bit like, hey, you should, you should probably click me now. Again, it's not really a game, but the fact that I can play a game about matching colors while being colorblind is kind of interesting considering I couldn't play the other ones. I know there's a lot of these simple games that I'm kind of being a lot nicer to than some of the other ones, and that's because they're not actually trying to be a game. Like if something isn't promising to be the best game ever, but it's just promising to be a thing where you match up colors and it accomplishes that goal well, I can't really be mad. Color Page ASMR First off, it's not very ASMR because there's music playing the whole time and you can't mute the music and only have the sound effects of the marker on paper and the music and marker are kind of the same volume so you can't really hear it that well. All you have to do here is click to make the marker draw, stop as soon as you can close to the dot, you can undo if you go too far, and then select the colors for the drawing. It doesn't have to be the one the person asks for and then you just color it in. It's more of a zen game than anything, the point isn't necessarily to win or get points as much as it is just to relax in color. I don't play a ton of these zen games or zone out apps like, you know, the unpacking one or house flipper or whatever, but I have no quarrel with anyone that does, I totally get it. Sometimes you just want your fingers to be doing something while you're chilling or eating or listening to a podcast or watching a movie that's not visually interesting. One thing I think is funny is that you don't have to stop the marker at the point where it tells you to and they don't really care if you do or don't so you can just keep going and make a long line and low key it's alt and abstract as hell. I actually kind of dig some of the designs I made. <laughs> if you're asking me who the perfect audience for this game is, 100% young kids who don't really know what they're doing. You cannot mess it up, you can pick any colors you like. And every 15 pictures or so, you just get a big drawing that you get the color in. Color Pixel Art. It's a color by numbers thing, except it's somehow worse than paint because you can't drag and draw. If you hold onto the mouse, it drags the screen, which also makes sense for touch screens and stuff. But overall, it's just really repetitive and you have to click a lot, like more than a clicker game. I didn't even realize it was paint by numbers at first. I thought the numbers were just, oh, this is one section, here's another. And I was just vibing and doing my own colors and having a time. And then I realized you could zoom in and see the numbers. It still did not stop me from trying to make a reality escape panda. Although once you place the correct color, you can't go back with the wrong color, which kind of ruined my plan a little bit. And then I got arthritis, so I just stopped. Zero out of 10, don't bother. Crazy Caves. Crazy Caves is basically a modern bubble trouble. You play as a miner in a minecart going back and forth, smashing the rocks falling from the ceiling. You'd think you could stand still, but things will come at you from angles, so you have to keep moving. And after a certain amount of points, the game just stops you and you go to the next level. You also have three upgrades. The game doesn't tell you what they are, you just have to look at the symbols and guess. The first one is, I think, double coins, which I guess makes them worth more, or maybe there's more coins on the map. The second one, I'm pretty sure, is damage. And then the last one, I think, is how fast you throw the axes. But again, the game doesn't really explain what these are. You can also collect gems, which help you unlock new carts, which are just visual, and new levels, which I assume the numbers just go higher. Nothing overly exciting, but it does as advertised. Cube Master 3D. Cube Master 3D is a game where you have a rotating puzzle of different designs and shapes. You have a bar of seven slots below and you need to find three identical cubes in order to clear out those spots. 
They don't need to be in a row either, so you can just hold on to two and wait to find the third later as long as you have room. If you hit seven and have no matching trio, then you either have to pay 300 gold or restart the entire puzzle. Gold can be used for restarting, using the light bulb which automatically grabs a random trio for you and keeps your combo streak alive, and a rewind one in case you've grabbed a piece that you can't complete. You can take as much time as you want, but the main thing that kind of keeps you going fast is the time limit, which is very generous, and the combo where you want to make sure not too much time passes in between collecting three. Points and stars don't really matter, just get it done in time and you can move on. Cube Tower. My first tower defense game covered in over five years. So if you're interested in tower defense games, there's a few more videos on my channel, pretty old ones, that you may be interested in, both are extremely out of date. Maybe I should consider making sequels. Cube Tower, while in need of a much better name that actually reflects that it's a tower defense game, like Cube Tower Defense, and not just some game about stacking cubes, is a really fun basic tower defense game, but it is missing some fundamentals. The game uses an energy system, so you have a max and a recharge rate, and this is how you place and upgrade your towers. It's not an endless one. You play maps and you get little cubes, which the game calls coins, but they're not, to upgrade your stats. There are three types of towers, the gun, the cannon, and the laser, and both have branching trees and two trees on top of that to upgrade. You can also upgrade your general cube, which is where the enemies go at the end of the map, and you can increase your total life, your energy total, and your recharge rate. Although, at the end of every map, you get one to three coins depending on how you did, and if you want all three coins, then you need to beat the stage without losing a life anyways, so I don't really think there's a point in investing in life. It's not perfect by any means, there's a few things missing that I would consider not necessarily essential, but it's kind of weird that it doesn't have. There's no wave counter. And I know there's not a lot of waves, but when you're constantly upgrading and having the upgrading screen up, which blocks most of the screen, it's very easy to lose track. There's also no range indicator. I have no idea how far these towers go, and it's just little things like that that make it more smooth. It's overall a pretty short game. I did have to do a few levels more than once. I think a huge advantage to this one is that you can play the same save from your PC to your phone, although it's a little awkwardly formatted on PC, that feature alone is something I've never seen before, and it's not even a highlighted feature, it's just something that all YouTube games do. It's a very generic tower defense game, but considering it's free, it's easy to play, a little bit of a challenge, and will take you a little bit to complete, if you're a fan of the genre, I think it's worth checking out. Cut the Rope Cut the Rope is your classic cut the rope game. Use physics to feed the candy to the animal thing. That's all the game is, and that's all the game will ever be. It feels pretty good and smooth, it's a bit awkward because it's clearly meant for mobile so it doesn't fill out a ton of space, and at one point the game points to a replay button that clearly is not there. So as far as ports go, it's a pretty minimal effort, but if for some reason you missed the cut the rope craze, which was literally 14 years ago, then here's your chance to live it again. Daily Crossword. It's a daily crossword. It's not bad. I personally do the New York Times mini crossword every day because I like the hints. They actually make sense to me. And other ones are so vague that they kind of piss me off. And it's kind of one of my pet peeves where the only way you can figure out what a word is is to do everything else around it and use context clues. I'm not really a fan of that, which I also know is a part of the game and a point of crosswords because I just don't like traditional crosswords because I'm not smart. And I don't know a lot of words and I'm very insecure in my ability to be a writer. But uh, this is uh, this is a, a crossword uh, game, and uh, it's not bad. It's free, and, and and you can it's daily, so you can you can just keep doing it. Daily solitaire. It's solitaire, but it's daily. Much like the New York Times mini crossword, I also try to play a game or two of various types of solitaire every day, just to take a mental break from editing every so often. You don't want to be staring at something for more than an hour. Take a break, move your eyes around, get your brain thinking in a different way. I'm not an overly huge fan of ones like this where it's more of a puzzle, like they've built the deck and there's generally only a few ways to solve it. I much prefer to just shuffle the cards in and play whatever hand it gives me, although I know sometimes that leads to a lot of incomplete games. but. Otherwise, it's just like Solitaire. 
but chances are you have Solitaire and the Casual Games app on your computer already, or you can find a better one on your phone. Again, this is maybe where having your phone and computer share a save might come in handy one day if you're really determined to get some sort of daily streak going, but otherwise, there's a lot of different ways to play Solitaire. There's nothing special about this one. Dessert DIY. Okay, so this game literally got added in the middle of me writing this video, which tells me that there are games constantly being added to this list of playables, so knowing me, a dozen will be added the day after this video comes out. And also, this person in heart glasses needs a dessert, and they need it now. In this game, you work at an ice cream store. Sometimes the customers want specific things, and sometimes they just want you to make an order for somebody else. My first ice cream I thought was pretty good, but then this guy came in wanting a... Yeah, for his... ex? Um, I'm not doing that. That is toxic, and you need to just move on. So I made her the nicest ice cream, and I genuinely cannot tell if she liked it or not, because what is this hand emotion, and why did she accept an ice cream from her ex? But I also, I didn't even have time to process any of this, because suddenly Billie Eilish was in my shop. So again, I did some good work until a lady came in saying she was bullied by some mean girls. So I put... <sighs> yeah, okay. You, sometimes you have to, right? I don't know why this is available in my shop, but I did it. And then, in a massive plot twist, the mean girl was the ex from earlier. Girl, you gotta stop accepting ice cream from so many random people. And then, in a moment that I can only describe as the biggest jump scare of my entire goddamn life, Kanye West showed up. I don't have to tell you what I put in his ice cream, I'm sure. Again, I cannot tell if he liked it or not based off of that reaction, but I got two stars, and then a lady asked me to make an ice cream for her boss that just fired her. Again, I think it's probably weird to buy ice cream for people that are exiting your life, and I figured that pettiness probably got her fired in the first place, but oh my god. The game does not evolve beyond this, even if you mess up, the customers seem to like it and they will always keep coming and making the ice cream itself is like three clicks. I didn't even talk about the ice cream, I was so involved in the story of this for some reason. Uh, it's just a very strange and weird game. Honestly, it gave me more of a laugh than anything on this list, probably not for the right reasons, but hey, you can't put a price on laughter. Unless it's on my Patreon. Patreon. No, I'm kidding. We'll do that. We'll do that a little bit later in the video. Oh god. Okay. I'm I'm done with this game. Please, please get me out of here. Dig deep. Okay. I have a lot to say about Dig Deep. Because it is an idle game, kind of, but it doesn't really get to be an idle game. And chances are most of you are here because of my clicker games video. So let's dig deep into it. Get it? <laughs> I'm gonna be alone forever. Dig Deep is a game where you dig deep. Bro, this is a rough start. I gotta stop doing this. You walk back and forth on the ground, digging through one layer at a time, collecting balls. Once your bag is full, you head back up, place the balls onto a conveyor belt, which then turns them into coins. Well, it gives them to a guy who puts them on the belt and turns them into coins. And then the coins are used to unlock more plots of land to do it all over again. You can upgrade the speed of the conveyor belt and how fast the guy there unloads them, but this is useless, and you'll soon see why. Every plot of land has five sections, with the first one also having the guy in the conveyor belt. He stays there, he doesn't travel with you. On the top, you'll have three unlockable parts. The far left will be where you can hire up to four diggers, basically keeping holes active while you're not around, focusing on the other ones. Diggers can also be upgraded for digging speed and carry size. Your player character also levels up his carrying size the more you pick up as well, I should mention, I guess. On the right side, you have a pet store. While digging, you'll collect gems. Gems can be used to buy pets from the store. You'll start off with one pet slot, but you can have up to three, which you get pretty early on, and the pets act like multipliers for gold. You get one for free if you visit every eight minutes, but there's nothing else to spend gems on, so generally you'll have enough to buy a few, then you just click and it'll give you the best ones available. In the middle is the monument. The monument requires a certain amount of balls to build, but once you build it, it will make all the balls from that pit worth more, from like 1 gold per ball to 10. You can also auto-set your workers to contribute directly to the monument, so while you minimize how much currency you're making, 
as soon as that part's over and the monument is built, they'll all go back to collecting and you'll get a huge wave of money. You can technically set some to sell and some to monument, but I'd actually recommend not because there's always going to be stuff to do, so you might as well just get the monument done early. Especially for the earlier holes because they're just not going to be worth that much anyways as you unlock newer ones. So just increasing their cost should be your number one priority. Beside the hole, you have two things. On the right, you have the black market, which sells your balls at a higher rate and only spawns in every five minutes. This is the best way to advance really quickly. Just make sure you're always going to the latest hole to do this so you get the best deal. On the left, you have upgrades for the minecart that sends the balls to the conveyor belt. The farther away you are from the beginning, the longer it takes for the minecart to travel. So this can upgrade the speed of the minecart, how many balls it carries, and how fast the guy loads them into the cart. However, this becomes obsolete, and it's kind of the biggest thing this game has going against it. As you dig deeper into the holes, you will unlock three things. At 10 layers, you'll unlock gem mining to help you get better pets. At 25, you'll unlock an elevator just to help you get in and out faster. But at 250, you unlock a portal. The portal sends the balls automatically to either the monument or to be sold. So in hindsight, the portal is a great idea. It speeds up virtually every process of the game, but it completely kills half the upgrades. If you know this before you play this game, then your pathway is extremely obvious. Never buy any minecart upgrades, don't buy any conveyor belt upgrades, and just focus on monuments. By the time the monument is done, you'll be close enough to layer 250 where you won't even need the ladders or elevators anymore, and thus, you will pretty much just make money without having to do anything, and you've saved all the money from the minecart upgrades. I appreciate speeding up the process of things, but not at the sacrifice of other mechanics that you've already taught the players about. I think it would have been really cool to not lose those things, at least make it so the portals just sends the balls to the minecart loader and not automatically sell. That way there's still incentive to upgrade all of those other parts of the game, then you have these cool decisions to make where you can upgrade the conveyor belt loader and have them unload super fast. Or you can just have this massive stockpile behind him and he's just trying to endlessly work through it and he has to get through all the cheaper ones before the more expensive one comes in because the cheaper ones are closer but then you upgrade the monument and suddenly it's worth a lot more. If this is truly meant to be an idle game, which I'm led to believe that's the case, then there's nothing wrong with keeping things slow sometimes. That's part of the fun of it, but also there's so much for you to do being active, like going and digging yourself, or walking around and upgrading everything. So there's always something for you to keep busy while you're waiting for these other things. And again, it doesn't erase half of the mechanics of the game. Another thing we need to talk about is traveling in this game. I just mentioned how waiting and taking time isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I do stand by that. But it also depends on where that waiting part of the game is. In Dig Deep, you have to walk to all these places to upgrade things, which is fine, but you have a scooter that unlocks to help you go faster. That's also great because when you get to 10, 15, 16 holes, it takes a while to go back and forth. But you only get the scooter for about 30 seconds, and there's a wait period between how long you can use it. This is super unnecessary, and there are long points of the game where you just have to walk and do nothing for a minute and a half straight. You can't even let your guy auto walk to a hole or something. You have to very intentionally hold a button down to make sure he is walking. When you get to the later stages of the game, the scooter is not enough to get you from one side to the other. It takes two to three minutes, and that is not the right kind of waiting because it makes the player feel like there's no progress being made and no real reason for it happening. There are 16 holes in the game. I don't know if this is the real ending or the full map. There's a paid version on Steam that also says it has co-op, and if I paid for this and invited a friend to play 16 holes with me, I'd be pretty upset. I actually kind of like this game. And if it fixed the traveling issue and it fixed the minecart issue, I would love this game and I would play this a lot. But to see it end so quickly like this kind of sucks. I try not to say, here's what I would have done when it comes to game development because I'm just a guy with opinions and I don't know any better. I've never made a game and I probably never will. But I really like this game. I see the potential in the format. So here's my two cents. Make travel faster and easier. Make it endless if the full version isn't already. 
get rid of the portals or at least have the portals transfer to the minecarts and figure out some sort of ascension mechanic and this would be a really fun addicting game. It genuinely bums me out that I can't keep playing and YouTube playables doesn't seem to have a way to erase game progress so I'm kind of just done with it. DOP2 delete one part part two? Confusing name, and it is the first one that they have here. You're not missing anything. There's no DOP1 delete one part one. All you do is have a scrub brush and you erase things. That's it. Sometimes you only have to erase certain parts, but for the most part, you just erase things and then move on. There's even a hint if you can't figure out which part you're supposed to erase, but I'd guess 90% of them are erase the entire screen and the rest require you to just erase a specific bit but sometimes you erase more and it still works. Not worth playing. DOP4. That's right, it's not DOP4 delete one part four or delete four part one or delete whatever, it's just DOP4. Two things I absolutely hate are inconsistent naming conventions and skipping sequels. How am I supposed to enjoy this without having played DOP3 delete three part two or whatever the heck it was called? I'm so lost on the story now. I, I How can I do this? Anyway, it's the same thing, except you draw instead of erase. It's not a bad idea, the execution isn't quite there. Draw Climber. Draw Climber is a really cool concept where you are a spinning cube with spinning axes on either side, and you have to draw the arms that will propel you through the course. The very first level you play on your own, you just have to complete the level, and it kind of makes you think this is going to be a puzzle game, and it very much is not. Because after this, every map is a race against an AI, because YouTube isn't connecting you to random people. The physics feel pretty good. The races can be really RNG heavy, sometimes the AI just gets stuck, and sometimes they crush it on the first try and you just completely get left behind. I really wish I had more to say about it, because I think it's a cool concept, something that could have existed on Flash 20 years ago, and something that if there is a separate app of it is probably decently fun, but it's also just a super simple concept, so there's not a lot of room for dissection or mechanical breakdowns, I've described to you the whole thing. Again, I'm sure a fuller app where you actually race people would be fun and cool, but fun game, I would like to see more of a puzzle concept personally, but it's cool. Element Blocks. Element Blocks is basically block drop again, but it's a little smaller, faster, and takes up more of the screen. The power-ups are less prevalent here, there's no blocks where you have to line them up twice to get rid of them, but instead there are stars and you have to use stars to get the power-ups, so it's way harder to get them and more rare to use them. The pieces are a bit different, the elements look confusing at first, but it's purely a visual thing, they don't actually do anything or matter. Overall, I think I actually like this one a little bit more than block drops, but it's pretty much the same thing. Pick your poison. Emoji Puzzle Emoji Puzzle is by far one of the most difficult games I have ever played. As the audience for games continue to grow and it enters the mainstream where it was not before, the conversation for accessibility and difficulty has grown. Older games did not have difficulty settings and thus for many, the entry to play games and be good at them was set quite high. Those who were inexperienced, uncoordinated, and simply did not have a full schedule to commit to practice were deemed unworthy of experiencing some of the greatest stories the medium has ever told. Not too long ago, we had a discussion that to this day remains ongoing about difficulty and its place within gaming. Some modern games include story mode, where players can play through with little to no threat, an enjoyable time for those who so simply just want to experience the story that the game has to offer and participate in elements that would otherwise result in death for the player character. Many don't play games to get frustrated, but rather an interactive way of relaxation, and for those, these options are perfect. For many other games, they often abide by an easy, normal, hard difficulty setting, which in itself makes you wonder, how was the game designed to be played, at what setting was intended whilst the game was being created, and just how are these difficulty settings altering the game? 
If an enemy simply becomes a damage sponge, taking longer to defeat with no additional strategy involved, is the game really harder or is it just taking longer to accomplish tasks? In the midst of these conversations, the Dark Souls franchise hit its mainstream popularity and the question was asked, do you think that Dark Souls should have a difficulty setting? Many people simply cannot engage with the games. Its difficulty is a part of the experience. It is something you must work on and overcome. It is much like a hike in the sense that if you cannot climb the mountain, you do not deserve to see the view at the top. However, there are many who wish to see the view at the top of the mountain, but a multitude of reasons prevent them from doing so. While they may physically not be able to climb, while they have other life obligations that prevent them, and so they look from afar, wishing to be a part of the exclusive club and enjoy the perks that come along with it, but realizing ultimately they will never get to experience them. The games are true to their form as art, uncompromising and unwilling to change its intentions and structure, and while you may think this would hinder the games and its promotability, it has actually done the opposite. While many stand on the outside still looking in, Others see completion of the From Software games as a badge of honor. Many stopped having fun along the way and it simply became about the challenge. People spending their free time and frustration and anger to complete this task, and while others would like to consume the world and its lore, they simply have enough frustration and anger in their everyday lives to commit their free time to doing that as well. In the end, I truly believe that all art should be consumed in every way possible. Once the words leave the author's hand, they lose all ability to control how it will make people feel. Once the song leaves the singer's lips, 100 interpretations of the same four lines will carry deep, heavy meaning for those who hear it. And while the artist loses control once the art is free, the artist can do as much as they can to prevent others from experiencing their art before that final moment, and so the question must be asked. Is this a culture you wish to participate in? Do you want to actively stop people from enjoying what you've created at no cost to the others, despite what they may claim? Alternatively, we as participants of the art may interpret and take what we will, but we cannot force how we want our artists to create. If an artist wishes to tell someone, my art is not for you, then it is something that we must accept, process, and move on. This is how I feel about emoji puzzle. I kind of, I'm sorry, I kind of, I think I lost track of the plot a little bit. I think I blacked out or something. Did I say something? Anything? Anyway, whatever. Moving on. Endless Siege. Endless Siege is a tower defense game in the style of the Clash of Supercell games, but from what I can tell, it's not one of those, but it's very much trying to replicate that look. Off the bat, the tutorial is awful. It tells you how to place and upgrade the towers, which, while pretty universal to the genre, is never a bad thing for people who may be stumbling upon this as their first tower defense experience. However, it doesn't tell you what the towers do, so you have to just experiment yourself, which sometimes can be fun, but sometimes you'd rather just be told. There's also only one map. You can only play the map of the day, which is really annoying when it's a game I'm actually kind of having fun with. It reminds me a lot of the balloon games, but very, very simplified. It's fun, but I can only play the same map so many times. And one of the worst feelings about gaming is when you want to keep playing a game, but you have to stop because there's just nothing else left to do. Also, some maps are very similar to others, and their way of making it difficult is just giving you less spaces to place towers. So sometimes you wait a whole day, and you just get almost the same map. This one map only had 20 spaces to put towers in it, and that kind of takes a lot of the fun out of it. In Endless Siege, there are four towers, the Ballista, Torch, Cannon, and Time Warper, all which can be upgraded. Ballista is your run-of-the-mill, quick damage tower. Torch is a bit stronger, reloads slower, and has a farther range, but its upgraded versions have an area of an effect attack, which make it probably the best tower, at least as far as I got. The Cannon has splash damage, and the Time Warper is the most confusing, because in its base form, it's a wave slowdown. It slows down everything around it, but if you upgrade it, it becomes a single target thing that teleports and units back onto an earlier part of the map, but also it's like very slow, so it's really not worth it. In my opinion, I'd rather much have the slowdown, but of course you don't have to upgrade it. It's a really basic tower defense game. Imagine Bloons TD, but light, and you'll find yourself just wanting to play Bloons after because you'll wish you had many more options. I think I prefer it a little bit over Cube Tower just because I prefer endless stages more than I do completing a map and then moving on just as you get the setup that you want, but that's a personal preference. I think there's fun to be had with both. Farmland. 
Farmland is a farming simulator idle game hybrid. You start off with a little parcel of land and you have to farm it to sell your crops. The farming process is very simple. Walk over once to plant seeds, once more to water, once more to harvest. Then you walk over to the appropriate vendor to sell what you've got. Eventually, you'll use money to unlock more crops and more land, and after a while, you'll unlock a barn. The barn works as an idle system. You can hire workers to work on the land you've discovered, and while you don't have a weight limit as to how much you can carry, they do. Once they hit it, they'll put their crops into the barn until it's full. Once the barn is full, they'll stop collecting crops until you've collected them from the barn, which creates the majority of the game loop. At the barn, you can pay to increase overall storage space as well as worker speed. But of course, you'll have to decide what's worth upgrading over that and expanding your land because there is a lot of different directions you can expand in. Along the way, you'll encounter animals that need to be stopped at to collect resources and trees that drop fruit and do the same. It seems like a lot, but the game does some things to help you out. After a while, you'll get a single vendor that you can sell all of your stuff to for the same price as other vendors. And there's another guy who will tend to all the animals if you go visit him, and another that collects all the fruit from trees. You don't have to chase them all around, but the map is pretty big, and so it will take a while to do a full loop and visit everyone. While it's obviously much faster to keep farming for yourself, you can in theory just let your workers do the majority of the work, thus making it a game that does idle eventually. But it is way more beneficial to continue playing, obviously, something I highlighted in my Clicker video many years ago as something I really enjoy seeing in these games, a hybrid option. I really like this. It's really simple, but everything just works together really well. It's not the most fun farming, it's pretty brainless, and going back and forth on the same piece of land really bores you, so you have to have something else going on. But I left this game open for probably a week until I kind of finished it. I expanded all the land and there was nothing else left to buy. And I know that I mentioned this a lot already and I'll probably mention it more, but the fact that as an idle game, I can do what I need to do on my phone and it affects my browser version is really cool. Because I can just sign in for two seconds, collect all the stuff from the barns, and be on my way again until I'm ready to sit down and play. It'd be really cool if to see more idle games do this. Maybe idle games do do this already and I just don't know, but I like the idea. Even if standalone idle games just have a separate app that is a check-in app that allows you to just collect stuff like this, I think it's a really cool idea, something I'd love to see more of in the future if it hasn't already existed already. I try to stay away from idle games as much as I can, like, I have a problem. There is a lot of walking around the longer you play, but unlike a game like Dig Deep, there's always stuff to do when you're going from place to place. There's stuff to pick up, there's animals to tend to, there's people to visit and sell things. It's the perfect mix of a game that isn't going to capture my attention so heavily that I'm going to lose sleep over it, but it still scratches that itch of signing in, getting a bunch of money, and spending it all. It took me about four, five, maybe six days to unlock everything and finish the game, but of course I always want more, but I'm glad not to have it, otherwise you would never see the end of this video. Find Out Find Out is like a more busy and intense version of some of the other games we've already played, where it's like hide and seek, and you have to cause some chain reactions to find the thing you want. It's super unintuitive, sometimes you have to hold the click, but there's no feedback to tell you that you're clicking the right thing. And you can tell that when this was developed, there was a very singular focus on the solution. Like some of the solutions, the person probably said, oh, it's obviously this, and there was no one else to say, actually, this makes no sense, and players will never think this is possible. But the game gives you lots of hints, and it's still confusing. This is my least favorite, I think, of the entire batch. Find the Alien Find the Alien is a game where you have to use this x-ray thing to find aliens and zap them. You just walk in on people's lives during dance parties, or domestic disputes, or whatever this perhaps soon-to-be intimate moment is? My favorite is when there's more than one alien because everyone else just fails to react to you killing someone right in front of them. Like this police officer runs instead of, I don't know, firing back. It's not like he knew his partner was an alien. Or does he? At one point you interrupt an alien love protest by killing aliens. There's such little story and yet it somehow manages to be disturbing every single time. At the end of every level, you just shoot up a spaceship and talk to the alien king, and then that's kind of it. Eventually, the aliens start turning into gorillas, or wigs, or plants, or carrots, which apparently count as citizens saved. 
I really struggle to think of who the intended audience is for this game. For some of these simpler experiences, no doubt a kid who has grown up in an iPad generation that I really can't comprehend, or maybe an older person discovering the world of phone games and touchscreens for the first time, they can honestly enjoy the simplest of things. However, this is just, like, slightly too violent for me to think that a kid should be playing it, unless kids are exposed to way more violent things these days, I have no idea. But I feel like by the time a kid was old enough to play this, it just would not satisfy them, they would want to do something else. Flow Legends Flow Legends is a game where you connect pipes of water, sewage, or green ooze and make sure it gets to the appropriate destination. It's not quite a puzzle game like you'd expect with a grid system and grabbing the appropriate parts, something similar to perhaps the Bioshock hacking puzzle. You literally just grab the tubes and connect them. Occasionally you'll have puzzles where you have sand and you have to click the sand to get rid of it in order to let whatever is in there go to the bottom, and you can't really fail this. The game takes little to no brain power, but has some really odd mechanics, like the little plumber you play as has skins for some reason, and there's a city building feature where you have to place buildings and items like a dark cloud game, but it's never really explained why you're doing this or what the point is. Some of the challenge honestly just comes from you not being able to tell which liquids these are when confronted with two options, and if you get it wrong, you lose a star you can't get back unless you spend your coins on it. The overall look of the characters dancing and smiling really creeps me out as well, and a few times the game just straight up crashed on me with endless bubbles, which, you know, isn't very fun. Fork and Sausage This is a puzzle game where you have to get the sausage onto the fork. Sometimes there are traps or buttons to hit first, but for the most part it's pretty easy to see what you need to do. What isn't easy is controlling the sausage, and I don't know if that's intentional or not. There is a delay on controlling the sausage, which is a sentence I've not said before, so you can only hit about one direction per second. So you can often see I'm losing control and I'm having a difficult time doing what I want to do. Now it may be that this is a part of the challenge. It's a slippery sausage that's hard to control and thus makes your task harder to complete, but if this is the case, the game doesn't really make it known what its intention is. It doesn't make you feel like that's a part of the challenge, so you might just end up feeling a bit frustrated. The level design itself is also a bit odd. You have things like jelly to bounce off of, but if you keep hitting up, you just keep jumping up forever, so it's also a bit redundant, you don't need it. This developer has made quite a few games on this list. I haven't really enjoyed any of them, but I also think they're aiming to target a much younger audience. I could perhaps see a young ghost boy giggling at a sausage with eyes, maybe. Free Cell Solitaire It's Free Cell Solitaire. I'm not going to explain the rules of Free Cell Solitaire in this video, but if you know how to play Free Cell Solitaire, it's that. It plays fine. Free Kick Football Kick the ball into the net. Get as many points as you can. It's actually not bad. It's a lot more enjoyable than basketball fervor, and you can curve your shots midair as well. Initially, I thought the curving of the shots was really subtle and not something you could rely on, but it turns out that you have to re-click once the ball has been kicked to curve it, I guess because if you're on mobile, you're doing a flicking motion and then you have to put your hand back on the screen to curve it, so they just assumed you would do something similar with a mouse. Honestly, you feel like a beast when the ball hits the top corner or you make a good shot, and you get a little mad when this goalie dude is just doing his job. I, he's, he's, he's getting paid to stop the ball and I'm getting mad at him, and it's, that's not fair. Also, a funny but completely irrelevant story, I put my iTunes on shuffle and I was just listening to all these songs that were completely random, and of all the songs to come on while I was playing this and recording this footage, it was Hall of Fame by The Script, which is not only a song I haven't heard in like many years, it's also a song I have zero recollection of putting on my iTunes, but goddamn, it made me feel hardcore scoring these goals with that song playing. Full Speed Racing Full Speed Racing is a racing game where you have to hit each checkpoint to continue going, and every time you play, you get coins which you can use to buy and upgrade your cars. So in that sense, it's technically a roguelite. The game is very simple, just turning, drifting, and a turbo, but it's pretty fun for what it is. I think visually this has been my favorite game so far, it's very distinct and stands out. And I played most of these games on mute, but I did unmute this one just to see what it sounded like, and I like the sound too, although it's a bit 
unbalanced, so the car crashes are way louder than everything else. I do wish there was a second map or something or a marker to keep track of how far you got last time so I can try to beat it like beating my own ghost kind of thing, but it's all just stuff you have to keep track of in your head. It's best to go in with this being like a speedrun or a roguelite game where you're going to have to play the beginning a lot, but as the cars get better and you memorize the map more, you'll get better, and then you just continue to get farther every playthrough. Gin Rummy I'm not going to go over the rules for Gin Rummy. The gist of it is that you have to collect cards in either sets of three or a sequence where at least three cards are all in a row. And then when they're a sequence, they don't count towards your deadwood number. And once that number is low enough, you knock and all the remaining cards that aren't in sequences or sets of three get counted and then you do the scoring. I'm not an expert and I may have gotten all that wrong, but I did win a game, which I'm very proud of. And to speak on the game itself would be like to speak on the card game itself, which just isn't the whole point of this. The app works perfectly fine. Most of these card game apps are pretty hard to screw up. It's turn-based and the mechanics and rules can all be built in. It's really just up to the AI being good or not. Um, and I can't comment on if the AI is good or not because I've never played Gin Rummy against a human being or another AI, I'm just this one. But honestly, this is my favorite game on the entire app so far. This is the only one I've gone back to play more than three times uh, besides the ones I already finished. I, I really like Gin Rummy and this is just a very easy way to play against an AI that is somewhat challenging. And I'm not very good at the game, so even if it's a weak AI, that works for me. But yeah, I love this. This is my favorite one. This is the only reason I will ever open up YouTube Playables after this video is over. Gold Mahjong Fervor. Luckily for me, this is the puzzle matching variety of Mahjong and not like the real version with those really cool looking tables because I think if the spirit of my Chinese ancestors saw me attempt to explain the rules of this game, I would probably have misfortune cast upon me and my family for generations. I don't even know how to pronounce Mahjong. I think that's how you say it. They're probably getting mad at me for that too. You've probably seen some version of this before. Basically, you have to match the images to remove the tiles and once you get to the two gold tiles, then you're good. There is sometimes a wrong way to do things. It's not as simple as just matching the shapes. You have to look at what matching will unlock on lower tiers and account for it. But the game does give you unlimited undos to help you out. Not much more to say beyond that. It's pretty standard, but it plays just fine. Helix Jump. Rotate the tower and send your ball down as far as you can without hitting the color you're not supposed to. There's two power-ups you can buy with the money if you're not spending it on skins, which is speeding up and smashing through a few platforms and protecting yourself from potential death for a limited amount of time. There's also a leaderboard, but the leaderboard never changes. You're always roughly in the same position with a bunch of AI portraits around you because YouTube playables don't connect to other users. It's really finicky. If you have a trackpad or a bad mouse, then you won't be able to do this at all. I imagine it's probably a lot easier and more intuitive on mobile but it could be a fun challenge to improve your mouse dexterity, I suppose. And hey, we're kind of at the halfway mark of this video, and if you're enjoying it so far, I would love for you to come check out the other stuff I have, uh, whether it's me streaming live on Twitch, whether it's my other channels like my Ghostboy259 channel where I have single game reviews of games that I've streamed. You can come join us on Discord, hang out in the Discord, join us for uh, very smart, intelligent chats about things that uh, don't happen, but if you join, maybe it'll get smarter and it, it could happen. And you can also check me out on Patreon if you want to see a behind the scenes video of this, of every video I make, if you want to see content a little bit early, all that stuff really helps me out. And the more support I get on literally any of those, even without paying, if you just go subscribe to the other channels or come watch me on Twitch, all of that helps and helps me make content faster for you. So thank you for watching please go check that out and follow me on Twitter or X or whatever the crap, whatever. Hide and see. I am going to assume that this game is 100% meant to be played with other people, and Loki, I think that would actually be kind of hype. Basically every round you pick one or two seekers, and if you're a seeker or a hider, then you do the thing. If you're a hider, you can see the seeker and his line of sight, and if there's only one, it's obviously incredibly easy to remain hidden, and if there's two, it's maybe a bit trickier, but they don't work together in tandem, and often they'll end up on the same route so you can avoid them. Sometimes there are little puddles on the ground that have gold on them, so if you want the gold, you'll have to step through, and then your footsteps will be visible for a while, 
but the gold only unlocks skins, so there's almost a no point in collecting it, but I try to anyways, because otherwise it just feels pointless. Once your fellow hiders get captured, you can also go up and release them, and they can go and release you, but the game doesn't tell you that they can release you, it just offers the restart button right away, so unless you wait, you actually won't ever find this out. When you play as the Seeker, everyone is invisible, unless they stand in the puddles. But you can see the direction they all go at the beginning, and it's not crazy hard to find a majority of them right away. I don't know if they can free their allies, I never personally saw it happen. And it will also have random points where you can see a cloud of white dust, so it's very much saying, hey, here's where they are. Which is a little annoying because it means the seeking isn't entirely skill based, but I suppose in a 30 second game where everyone's running more or less the same speed, you have to give some sort of advantage to the seeker. Again, playing with the same NPCs over and over isn't the most exciting, but I think playing a longer version of this game with a bigger map and a few friends in a lobby would actually be pretty fun and hype. Maybe like a prop hunt thing, but it, honestly prop hunt already exists, so just do that. Idle Restaurants Idle Restaurant is an idle game that's pretty quick and goes by really fast. You pretty much start the game making money and you just never stop. In terms of a restaurant management game, it's non-existent. You don't have to pay a lot of attention, you don't have to clean things, pay salaries, customers don't get mad. You just control the chefs, where you can upgrade their meal quality so that each meal is worth more, up to three stars. And then you control the speed of the conveyor belt, so how fast customers get their food, the price of the food, and how many seats are in the restaurant. There are tips on the conveyor belt occasionally, but beyond that, just click and sit back and wait. The tutorial mentions a food critic boost that doubles everything, but it's just not here. I assume maybe if there's a mobile app version that it's there and it's probably at the cost of an ad, which is pretty common for these types of games, but it was not implemented in this version. You can only manage one restaurant at a time, but your money carries over from place to place. So even if you go to a new restaurant, your old one will still make you money. So you might as well just finish upgrading that one before moving to the next one. These kind of things are my favorite because I like to do dumb things like only increase the seat count even though the service is super slow and there's only one chef working for cheap and then come in with a heap of money and upgrade it all at once. Things do eventually max out though so you might as well just max everything out early before moving on. It's very simple, very easy, very very casual, but it works. You make enough money that you never really want to step away from what's going on for too long. There's no way to mess it up or get anything wrong or put something in the wrong upgrade. I would definitely put this on the cozier side of the games on this list and I finished it in about a day or so and that includes stepping away for sleeping time and then coming back and it's done. Jewels Planet It's Bejeweled. Line up three jewels and get points. Line up more, get cool gems that do cool things, and get even more points. You have a limited amount of turns and a lot of power-ups to use. You have to use coins to buy them, and the way to get coins is to complete levels. You're not really going against someone, but rather someone's score. Profile pictures that look maybe a little bit less like AI, so I've decided to blur them out just for safety, but they're really just placeholders. They don't make a difference or matter. Win or lose, you get the coins, and then you just do it again. It doesn't build to anything, there's no levels or anything like that. You kind of just keep doing it, which is kind of the foundation of a lot of these games. They also try to be a bit fancier than Bejeweled by making maps not a box, but honestly, I hate this. It puts a lot of emphasis on how you can get four or five in a row to get special gems that will rack you up a ton of points, and then it gives you maps where it's almost completely impossible to get four or five in a row. Thus cutting you off from the most desirable part of the game. It also gives you options like doubling your coins or getting three extra moves when you pretty much lost. And I'm pretty sure both of these are supposed to be attached to ads, but since there's no ads, it's just a free boost that you might as well do. Some games really didn't bother to change or adapt their game to the platform, and it shows which ones did and which ones didn't. Honestly, they may not have even had an option. It might have just been straight ported and some of them just had the foresight to think ahead. Knock 'em All. Knock 'em All is a weird first person game where you have crash test dummies walking as slowly as they possibly can towards you, and you can either shoot them on their body to knock them off the platform, or most likely shoot them in the head, which just knocks them out. I don't know why they made the movement like this. Between segments, you just jump around and, you know, you know what I'm gonna say. 
motion sickness inducing, am I right? It's really cool. You can upgrade your gun, but you don't need to. Occasionally you have a boss fight which you have to shoot the bombs coming your way or you'll die, but the bombs often go out of your field of view too quickly or they're hidden by your gun, and if you're on mobile they'd probably be hidden by your hand too, but it's really the only chance you'll have of dying while playing this game and there's no consequences so it doesn't matter. The most annoying part is that when you unlock a new gun, it always starts you off with the first one. So if you're trying to go fast, you'll keep picking the wrong starting gun by accident. It's just a small detail that you don't really think about until you play it, but if I have a better gun, I always want to use it. Or at least just let me use the last gun I equipped, and then if I want to change, I'll change it on my own. There's also a power-up bar that charges and gives you some explosive ammo, but you won't need it. Honestly, this game looks like it would be cool to speedrun, but I'm not going to sit through what I assume is over 100 levels to find out how or if it ends. Ludo Karts. Ludo Karts is a very basic board game. You probably played something similar there, are, or actually maybe you haven't. Do kids play board games nowadays? There are many games similar to this in the board game echelon, such as Sorry, Parcheesi, or of course, Ludo. Players have four carts in their starting zone, and in order to get out, you need to roll a six. Anytime you roll a six, you get to roll again. If you land on another cart that isn't your color, they will get sent back to their starting zone, and they will once again have to roll a six to get out. Along the way, you'll have little power-up spots that give you things like adding plus four to your roll, choosing which number you roll, sending an opponent backwards, an oil spill that causes opponents to stop when they hit it, or freezing a car, which then can't move until that player rolls a six. There is a decent amount of strategy involved, although a lot of it is just luck, and most of that strategy is just which car you move when. And unfortunately, there is way too many times where you can just be stuck at the finish line or at the starting area just waiting for the right number. Once you're in the finish zone, you need to have the exact amount of spaces left in your roll to win, but if you have something like 5 and you roll a 3, you can still use the 3, you just have to finish with the right number. The first player to get all four carts in the finish line wins. There's no second or third place, you just win or lose. Occasionally, carts will glitch and get stuck, and I've only ever seen it do it when a cart was technically finished already, so visually you just have to remember, but it is kind of buggy. That's the game in a nutshell. It's slow, it takes like over an hour to finish a game sometimes, and for some reason I played it multiple times. I cannot really explain the compulsion. It was such a low effort thing to have on the side that required such minimal attention, and even though I'm pretty confident I will go the rest of my adult life having never played a game of Sorry ever again, it was just the perfect little side thing that I could barely pay attention to but still feel like I was playing something. The game has an option to do multiplayer, however, and if you do that, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Just don't. Just don't do it. Just stop it. Stop it right- Stop- Ludo King. It's the same game, but it's worse. It's literally just the board game. So take away all the power-ups and you've got Ludo. The only real discernible difference is that when you're in someone else's starting area, it's also considered a safe zone. So sometimes spaces get just a little overcrowded. And when you bop someone back to the start, you get an extra turn. But without the power-ups, it's basically a worse version of the other one. The whole appeal of board games is playing with other people, so even a basic game like this, which you're probably playing with like an elder or a child anyways, can be fun in the right group, but this just isn't exciting. Lunchbox Ready If you thought that ice cream game was shallow, this is shallower than a mountain range. I don't know if I'm using that correctly because it's not shallow. No, it is shallow, right? And then if I say it's a mountain, then it's not, because it's the opposite, because it's very unshallow. All you have to do is pack lunch boxes. For some reason, you run a business where people just walk up to you and you pack their lunch, and then they give you money for it, and you just keep doing that. You can stack the boxes any way you want, although sometimes if you put an item in the wrong position, you can't fit everything in. And then you lack the motivation to undo everything, because why would you? Man, this guy wants way too much chocolate milk. Magic Cat Academy. I never thought I would actually enjoy a game called Magic Cat Academy. It's legitimately difficult. Ghosts will swarm you, the magic cat, obviously, and one of five shapes will be over their head. A vertical line, a horizontal line, an arrow pointing up or down, or a lightning bolt. You have to do the symbols to get rid of the ghosts before they get close, and there are a lot of them, and they don't move slowly. 
It helps once you figure out that for the arrow shapes, you can do a curve instead of an actual point. But even then, there are a lot of things to look at at once, and I legitimately started to panic while playing. The only downside is that the game is only about seven minutes long until you're done the whole thing. I really enjoy this concept. It feels very Flash game inspired to me, or maybe something you would see on the Wii, but it wouldn't work. I imagine it would kind of be awful to play on mobile, especially for right-handed people, because most of the bosses tend to be on the right side of the screen, where your thumb would be over the phone, so it would be pretty easy to accidentally block your own view. But otherwise, I really like it. I just kind of wish they made it longer, and I consider myself a fan of Magic Cat Academy. What a strange sentence. Makeup Kit Color Mixing in this game, you select four colors from a random image that they've given you over hundreds to choose from and apply them as eye makeup to models. There are over 100 images of just things and people and stuff and you choose your four colors from it and then you just keep doing it over and over. I'm pretty sure some of these images, they do not have the rights to use and maybe one day I'll sit through and do them all. I'm not kidding. I am kidding. Am I kidding? Here's an Obama-inspired palette. Mechangelot, mech, mecha, mecha, angela, mechangela, mecha, mech, mech. Robot fighting. This is a POV fighting game where you play as a robot punching the crap out of various things. The game kind of sells you on this idea that you have to aim your attacks and then dodge incoming attacks, which kind of seems hard at first because you have less than a second to react to incoming attacks and aiming takes time, and you can get hit while aiming. And then you realize you don't actually need to aim, you can just hit the button. And then you get the wrist rocket, and then you never have to do anything again. Hitting the enemy stuns them briefly, and once you get a second attack, you just do two back-to-back -back attacks, you'll have them pretty much stun locked, and you'll be done in four to five hits, before they even get a single hit off. There's a PvP mode as well, where you can battle other players, but of course it's just other bots. There's nothing that really comes from it. It's kind of a shame it gets so easy because dodging was legitimately hard and required really precise timing, so I expected the game to be too hard, and then as soon as you get a second offhanded weapon, it becomes too easy. The enemy designs are really cool. Clearly someone put a lot of effort into them and took some inspirations from other medias that inspired them, but unfortunately once they start to repeat, I just lost interest. Merge Heroes Merge Heroes is a merging tower game where you have to merge matching numbers to make your hero stronger. Every time you defeat a monster, you gain gold. Gold can be used to upgrade your troops, spawn new heroes at random, of which there are four types, or you can upgrade your spawner, so instead of spawning level 1 heroes, you can spawn level 2 heroes. But it also means you'll most likely have to throw out your heroes that are below the spawning level because you can't level them up anymore. This game is really hard. All the enemies have a ton of health and you have to constantly move your champions around in order to kill them. It's not like a traditional tower defense where you can just leave them there. You also don't get a lot of money, but there's a lot of things to spend money on. You also have two abilities, the ability to freeze all monsters on the track and send a really powerful firestorm. Both are on a cooldown and it just hits perfectly so you can't use them both in the same wave. The game is a lot to manage. It's challenging, but the problem is what happens when you lose. Nothing. You'd think you'd restart since there's only one map, so it's time to face the challenge again and do better with your new knowledge. But no, once you die, the game just keeps going. It restarts the wave you were on, resets your cooldown, and you just get to try again, but you just get to keep everything. So with no consequences for failure, you can just keep grinding out upgrades, levels, and merges, and eventually you'll be strong enough to beat the waves without putting in any real effort or strategy. It's a very weird decision to just make death meaningless. Most, if not almost all wave games that are laid out like this, especially tower defense games, have a reset upon death. So it's weird that this game just has nothing. You actually get a bonus from dying, because you get to keep all the money and your cooldown resets, so you come back stronger after dying. It is a very difficult game until it becomes the easiest game in the silliest way. It's a cool concept, but it could benefit from more maps or consequences. Merge Master Another merging game where you have two options, warriors or dinosaurs. This is every nine-year-old boy's dream. And you pay an increasing amount of money to buy more, to merge them, to increase them, to be more powerful, to... you get the idea. 
One thing I kind of like is that you technically don't have to merge things, so if you want a full battlefield, you can do that, but it's almost always better to have the more powerful units anyways. Believe it or not, despite being a very different game from Merge Heroes, this game suffers from the exact same issue. When you die, you get money. Plus, you spin a wheel to multiply your money. You get more money for dying than you do for winning a round. So if you die, no biggie. You'll come back stronger, and you'll hit a 5x on your multiplier. I'm not opposed to games that you can't lose, or have mechanics built around that that make it more satisfying than challenging. I think for me, it's just a tonal issue. This game doesn't give off the vibe of, this merge will be really easy and you can merge forever and never lose. It gives me the vibe of trying to be a strategy game, not unlike Merge Heroes. If it's meant to be a casual game, that's fine, I like those too, but this casual game disguised as a strategy game is just very weird because you get total whiplash when you go in expecting one thing and end up with another. How am I playing a strategy game where my choices should have an impact and there should be consequences for losing, and yet the game Magic Cat Academy was significantly harder? If you can get over the fact that it's more akin to a clicker game than a strategy game, it's fine. It's addicting, it's satisfying, you watch your numbers go up and your dinosaurs get bigger, and that's the essence of life. That's what we like about games. Just a very odd way to present it. Merge Pirates. Our last merge game is rooted in your more traditional merging game, just with pirate ship power-ups and a hexagon system. Once you have at least three of the same number connected, they combine into one space, and that ship goes up by one number. When you combine three level 7s, the ship explodes, destroying all the adjacent ships and giving you more room. You've also got three power-ups, but I'm not really sure how you get them. The bomb destroys a ship, the two bombs destroys all ships with the lowest number, but I never managed to unlock it, and the saw lets you upgrade one ship automatically. You get your tiles on the bottom, you can't see what's coming ahead, but you can rotate spaces before you play it. Beyond that, it's very instinctive, you can probably guess how to play just by looking at the gameplay, and yes, I am absolute trash. And if you wish to leave a multi-paragraph analysis on how I can get better, I will pretend to read all of it. Mob Control HTML5. That's a part of the name, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be there, but it is. This game looks like that one game you keep seeing in ads but the game never existed, but now they're running ads to say the game does exist and it's a very strange world we're living in, but it's not that game, but it's kinda close. The whole point is to shoot out troops towards your opponent and destroy their castle. Battles happen in two phases, and if you get hit once, you lose. But as long as you're using the multiplying gates and looking out for oncoming guys, you should be fine. When you win, you get coins to upgrade your island buildings or whatever, and then that's kind of it. At the bottom of the screen, it gives you options like armory, missions, shops, and then you get ready for battle. It says normie and regular, but these options always say coming soon. You never actually get them. I have no idea if YouTube even intends on updating these games or if this is an earlier build, I don't know. It also says you're stealing coins whenever you invade someone, but as we've determined, this means absolutely nothing, and the way your opponents come at you is quite different. So I do wonder if there's a difference between defending and attacking online, or if it's just an AI defender every time, because this would be kind of fun to go one-on-one -on -one with someone. I have a lot of questions, and about zero desire to put in the effort to get the answers. It's really basic, but it's pretty fun to watch your mob duplicate and overwhelm the opponent. There's also a lot of 2x things, I'm pretty sure you're supposed to watch ads every time you use them, but since there's no ads, which on YouTube of all place is very odd, you can just always use them. I would be very interesting to see a world where this does get updated, but I'm not holding my breath. Moving Co. A packing game where you have to find pairs of items and put them in the box. On its own, it doesn't sound too bad, sure with a time limit anything can be challenging, but the real challenge here is the physics when you accidentally hit another item while grabbing a different one. They go flying everywhere, sometimes hiding items under others or just deflecting it away where you don't know where it is anymore, and making you have to be cautious about how you grab your items, you can't be too fast. The time limit can be pretty tight. And when you get stuck and you can't find the thing you're looking for, it really sucks because you start to freeze and the panic sets in. If you grab the wrong thing by accident, you lose your multiplier, but the only thing you can do is buy skins for your truck. Two out of the three upgrades you can buy, you cannot see during gameplay. So GG on that one. 
fun challenge, not something I would play in my free time, but a good challenge, and I like the concept a lot. My Perfect Hotel. My Perfect Hotel is a very bare bones version of a hotel simulator, but not in a bad way. It's actually quite fun. It's not quite an idle game. You can't really go full inactive, but there's enough that you can walk away for a while and come back and progress has been made. You start off on your own where you have to check people into rooms. Once they sleep for four seconds, you have to clean their room by waiting at a few spots for a few seconds, and then you go back to the long lineup of people who are waiting to sleep for a few seconds and repeat the process. Eventually, you can hire a cleaner to clean rooms. You can hire a receptionist to check people in. You can open up washrooms, which you charge money for, which is extremely unethical. There is always something to do, like a real manager job. You can help the cleaners clean if they're a little behind, you know, like a good boss. You're also the only one who can restock toilet paper for a while until you unlock the loader. There are tips that just hang out in every room until you go and collect them and they can add up to be quite a bit. Sometimes customers will want an iron or champagne or something that only you can deliver. And then of course you've got your dirty, filthy bathroom money to collect. The hotel just gets bigger and bigger. There is always something that you can be doing if you want to maximize profits, and then you'll just want to keep playing. The loader is also really, really slow, and you probably want to stay on top of toilet paper. You can upgrade all of them, and in the case of the loader, you can have multiple. My Perfect Hotel isn't really a game where you make choices. It's just a matter of efficiency. You don't have to say, okay, I want to hire six cleaners and four receptionists and five bathroom maintenance guys, you only have what the game offers you when it offers it to you. Sometimes you can't unlock something until you've bought others. I thought that a second receptionist would be useless for me given that I wasn't working very fast and all of my cleaners were behind anyways, but when I bought it, I got the option to buy faster cleaners. You can also upgrade rooms as well, and it's only when you've gotten what's available that you can unlock more of the game. Customers are also endless, so you'll always have a steady stream of income no matter what. It's not a game where customers' happiness is a factor. You don't have to worry about trying to keep things up or they'll stop coming. They will always be in line, ready, and waiting. It's not bad necessarily. You just have to prepare yourself for a pretty linear shoehorned experience. But sometimes, that's exactly what the doctor ordered. I would put this in Farmland on similar levels. You can tell they're both pretty decently sized games that are going to take a while to get through, and I'm also a little more drawn to idle games, they're close to me sentimental for obvious reasons, and chances are if you're here, you probably like them too because that's probably how you found me, but I do enjoy this. The biggest problem is that it ends after two to three hours. There's a part where it says you can unlock more of the hotel, and it just says the game is done. Out of curiosity, I looked online and it looks like there's an app version that's way longer and more in depth than what we got here. I'm kind of confused as to why full versions of these games weren't implemented. But then again, with no ads, YouTube isn't making any money by you playing these games. So maybe they just didn't bother to add complete versions. My Space Pet. My Space Pet is like if you vaguely described what a Neopet is to someone and they tried to make a game off of it. You have to keep it clean, you have to feed it food, give it energy, make sure it naps by playing the slowest version of DDR possible. Then with that energy you can play three games. Snake, a weird game where you have to make sure no one comes too close, or a somehow worse and less pleasant version of Flappy Bird. I think that this game might be targeted towards people about 25 years younger than I am, and even that might be a bit of a stretch. Northern Heights Northern Heights is a snowboarding game where all you do is click. If you're on the snow, you click to accelerate, let go when you hit a ramp to get air, and when you're in the air, click to dive down. I'm assuming if you hit a downward slope, you gain speed, but I have no idea if that's the case or if that's even possible. Maybe that's just wishful thinking. It might just be so you can get down to the ground and get more coins. At the end of the track, which seems to be RNG for the most part, you hit a ramp and try to go as far as you can. You get coins after your attempt, which can be used to buy outfits and visual things, but also increase your speed and your coin multiplier. So it can be pretty hard to justify spending that money towards something that doesn't help you in the game when you use the same currency to get a better score and go faster. It's fine, it just gets old really fast. Om Nom Run. I guess this game is based off of Cut the Rope because that's the thing's name. Anyways, th no, 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 it can't be, no, 
What is this? No. I... I, I can't... I can't do this. I can't... I can't... I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Own It Connect Classic. This is a really weird Connect 2 game where you need to match up two pieces. The game offers no instructions as you hop in, and later I found this graphic which is still really vague. It just feels really inconsistent. Sometimes I can connect two, sometimes I can't, I don't really understand. I know sometimes you like to be vague and fancy, but if it stops people from playing the game because they can't figure out how to play the game, then what are we doing here? Phone case DIY. Make a phone case. That's it. It's somehow less involved than making ice cream, which is honestly impressive. I got nothing else to say. It's art, it's magic, it's an experience. Someone give the Pope this game. Pirate Pop. It's another Bust a Move clone. It's a lot slower than the one that we played earlier. It's also a little more difficult. You actually get pieces you can't use and you have to burn them off to the side or whatever. Although sometimes you just won't get the pieces you need and you can't complete the map. Or maybe it's a lot harder than I thought. Either way, I'd still stick with the other one if you had to choose one, but pick your poison. Pocket Battle Royale. As the name implies, this is a battle royale game that happens in your pocket. What else do you need to know? The only control is movement. Everything else happens automatically. When you walk over a chest, it takes some time, but it opens, you level up, and you can pick up the weapon the chest drops. The game will also tell you if it's better or worse or equivalent to what you have already. To shoot someone, all you need to do is be in their vicinity, which of course means they'll be shooting you too. There's no aiming, everything is locked on automatically, and the red bars below your health is how much ammo you have. Once you're out of combat, you start to regain health, and after a set amount of time, a void will start to swarm the battlefield. It's very Fortnite inspired. Depending on your placement, you will get coins which you can use to unlock skins or upgrade your guns, and new stages unlock with a certain amount of wins. The gameplay of the game is not all that interesting. Maybe a bit more fun with other human players, but there's just not enough to do. It's a lot of standing still and shooting each other and taking hit for hit, but I will say that every other aspect of this game is done correctly. You unlock things for winning, you have coins which you can use for help or spend it on visual stuff. The progression and everything is perfect, it makes sense, this is great for this kind of a game and there's plenty to build up to with 10 different characters and 4 different maps, it's just the gameplay itself doesn't hold my attention. Pocket Champions I really like this game. Well over, I'd say 10 years ago when I was still in high school, yes I'm old, I played a hockey 3v3 version of this and I loved it. This is a little different but I still enjoy it. You have 5 forwards or strikers I guess and a goalie which is a larger unit that doesn't move as far. Drag back to shoot your players forward and hit the ball to get it into the net. Three goals wins. One thing this game has that my hockey one did not have is passing. If you hit the ball and the ball directly hits your own player, it becomes a pass. Which means that the player can take an extra turn and it'll actually push everything out of the way to get behind the ball. Meaning you can totally cheese this by putting a bunch of guys in front of your opponent's net and just pass it up front. Beyond that, you play to unlock skins and new levels where you can bet more per game. It doesn't really need more than that. If you don't enjoy the base game once, you're not going to enjoy it and unlock anything more enjoyable. My biggest criticism is that it randomizes which team you're playing, which makes sense because there's a bunch of different logos, but there's also a few black and white logos that are really annoying to play against if yours is also black and white. And you know I gotta be black and white, I gotta stick with the branding. Just an option to choose which color or to switch before a game would be nice. It's nothing game breaking because obviously you just need to look up and take your time, but even just adding different color rings around the logos would make a big difference. There's not much to it, but I really like it. It doesn't need a lot to it. It's a very fun concept on its own. Rainy Boba Cafe. This is not so much a game, but an experience. And I don't mean that sarcastically. You have three lines for boba pearls, the drink, and then syrup, and you can miss them all, and it doesn't matter, and you probably will because there's like a full second and a half delay between releasing the button and it actually stopping, and once you do five orders, the game ends. It shows you the credit, and a replay button, and that's it. When I went to film school, we had this thing about interactive media and games and the difference, you know what, I don't even have enough gameplay footage to tell you this story. 
there there's a difference between interactive media and games and this leans towards the former it's cute the art is nice it's an insane boba order and that's my thoughts retro drift retro drift is a flappy bird-esque game where you have to just take the car as far as you can whilst drifting like crazy you can collect vinyl records which can be used to get boosts like doubling your score which is the best way to get a high score insurance which means if you fall off the track you get one more shot and doubling the amount of vinyls on the track for when you're feeling spicy. Sometimes the game crashed on me when I tried to select them, but not all the time, so I don't know. You can unlock new cars, not sure if it's a visual thing or if they actually help, but if they do help, there's no indicator that says so. I'm really bad at these games. I was awful during the Flappy Bird era, so I'm not going to be better here when it's actually harder. I don't know when this game came out, it feels like if this came out 10 years ago maybe a lot of people would be comparing scores and trying to do their best to play better than their friends, but in today's gaming climate, it just doesn't stand out a ton. Running Pet Deck Room No. No. I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm afraid. I'll always be afraid darkness it, it pulls me in 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 but i must resist 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 be strong i must break free this world it's a cruel darn place but i can't 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 let it beat me let it beat me i must resist i can i can feel myself myself Scooter Extreme Scooter Extreme is a game where you drive a scooter down a street. You race other bots and you can do flips and stuff which boosts your nitro bar, but the maps, at least at the beginning, aren't long enough to fill your nitro bar. When you get airtime, you'll start flipping unless you let go of the left click, which is so counterintuitive to what's been ingrained in your mind as a kid. You know, hold go to go and then keep going and never let go. If you crash, the race is over unless you pay gold to keep it going, it's fine. The AI plays absurdly perfect in level 2 already, and I was definitely cheated out of this win, so I'm mad about it and I hate this game. Sculpt People As soon as I saw the UI, I knew this was going to be one of the worst experiences of my life, and it is with great sadness I announced that I was correct. There is no lesson to be learned here. There is no bridge to cross, let alone a bridge to be burned. I am simply less of a human being for having experienced this. My life is poorer than it ever was, and I will be thinking of this moment for the rest of my life because there is simply no way to move on from this. Even if I could go back in time to have never played this, the very essence of its existence has taken an undeniable toll on me from which I will not recover, that which transcends time and space. I am forever a worse and darker person for having opened this, and I may never find value in media again. Video games were a mistake. Slice It All Slice It All is a game where you play as a spinning blade and slice through it all. The more things you slice through, the more points you get. If you hit red, you lose. Unless you've hit a checkpoint, then you get one more shot. And at the end, you have to hit a multiplier along a wall to increase your points, which is kind of fun to try to get the best one. Visually, it's very satisfying. Cutting through everything looks cool, and when you hit a thing just right, it is the best feeling. Point and money-wise, after unlocking a different knife or swoosh effect, there is nothing to do. So you're kind of just going through levels, which honestly, it's satisfying enough that it could probably get away with it. You might get bored after a while, but once you realize that you actually don't need to cut anything, there's no minimum requirement, you can just flip forever until you hit the end of the stage, then suddenly it feels a bit pointless. Like I said, a point requirement before finishing would make things feel more like a challenge. It's possible the full app has this or has more things to buy or more things to do, but if you're just looking for a visually appealing experience of just cutting a lot of things in half, then I think it does that pretty well. Slime.io Slime.io is agar.io, but worse, and that's pretty much it. 
it's not at all optimized for browser. You can't dash and move forward at the same time because you can't hold the direction and dash, so it's impossible to aim your dash. It also doesn't tell you that dashing makes your slime smaller like it does on agar.io. You just kind of have to figure that out on your own. And you can also split like an agar.io, but same issue, you have to stop moving completely to do it. There's just so many slimes as soon as you start the game and the eye test is nearly impossible. It's very hard to just look and guess if you're bigger or smaller. I played for 10 minutes and I didn't eat a single other slime in that entire time. And honestly, all it did was make me want to go play agar.io instead. Stack bounce. Wait, didn't, didn't we? Oh, okay. So this is not helix jump, but it's similar enough that like if you vaguely described helix jump to someone and they tried to make a game based off of your description, this might be where you ended up. In this game, you control the ball and just break through the colored parts, avoiding the black. If you have enough platforms in a short amount of time, you get an energy boost where you just smash on through anything. Whereas helix jump was about controlling the pillar itself and trying to get as low as you could. This is a high score game that accumulates after pillar, after pillar, after pillar. You constantly are hitting the bottom of pillars and it randomly generates another one for you. Once you hit the black section, your run is over and then you just keep going again and again. The levels don't really change. They don't really get harder. It's just a matter of not making mistakes. It's pretty easy. It's visually satisfying. Not much more to say beyond that. State.io. This is another game I really like. I used to play a game very similar on Flash called Cloud Wars. If you've been around from my channel since the very beginning, you might remember I had a brief show called Quick Game Quick Thoughts, which was an unscripted show where I would just cover Flash games once a week. The playlist is on my channel. If you want to watch them, they're all unlisted and they're not that good. They kind of sunk my channel after a while, so I got rid of them. But I covered Cloud Wars in that series, and I genuinely can't believe I talked about it for 12 minutes. I, there's nothing that I could have possibly said to make that last 12 minutes. I probably just stretched out as long as I possibly could. Let's try to do it a little bit quicker here. In State Wars, you control a circle that is slowly generating units on a map of other circles. Between you and your opponents, there are unclaimed states, which when your number exceeds those, you can take them over, and then you have two states generating units, and I'm sure you can put it all together. The objective of the game is to take over your opponent to win. You don't have to capture all of the blank spots. Once your opponent is gone, it's an automatic win because obviously they can't take anything back. At the end of the round, you get coins, which can be used to unlock a higher number of start units, how fast you produce units, how much money you earn while offline, which is strange that it's there at all, but I'm not complaining, and you can buy some different logos and unit shapes if you want to look pretty. Eventually, you'll travel all around the world and get matchups where you face three or four NPCs all at once. Sometimes they will straight up gang up on you, and it sucks. Sometimes they all go for one spot because I guess the AI perceives it as like meta to capture this one spot and you can clean up easy. And sometimes you could literally just have to wait and then once they make the first move, you take their home base and they pretty much screwed themselves. There's a few complaints, mostly that you can't zoom in and even on a phone, it feels a little small and far away. It's even worse on desktop as you can see. It's annoying when you swipe your mouse over a spot and it doesn't grab those units. It seems to be a little bit too precise or you have to hold it for a little bit. And the whole point of the game is you're in a hurry. You, you want to go fast. And the maps do repeat themselves after a while. I get the name is State, but I would also have loved to see them branch out. I desperately want like a 100 spot battlefield with 10 different AI opponents or some crazy shenanigans where it's the entire world and there's hundreds of states that you can go to and try to take over but once the maps start to repeat and you're just playing the same game but with bigger numbers it starts to get a little old still i do enjoy this concept i just wish there was more to do with it stealth master by now you probably recognize an aspect of this ui pretty well this drag to move symbol haunts my very dreams and when I close my eyes, I hear the screams of the lost souls of our past begging for salvation and freedom from their eternal damnation. It turns out, this game is not at all similar to the other ones, in fact, it's entirely different developer. 
So perhaps the little drag to move symbol is actually a generic asset that developers use for games that are on both desktop and mobile. Someone in the comments will know, I'm sure. I should probably know, but I don't. The goal of this game is to assassinate your main target at the top of a skyscraper, making your way through each level on the way to the top. In order to attack, you just need to be within vicinity of them, so the only mechanic in this game is movement. Guards have their line of sight, which is visible to you, and most of their attacks can be dodged because they're pretty slow. They also don't shoot you instantly, they take a second to react, which is really nice because if you're like me, you can just go in charging, considering you're most likely going to have a melee weapon. During your climb, you'll occasionally come across a store which you can buy things to aid for your attempt, but they only last for that target, and if you die, you lose it. These can be things like heals, better weapons, upgrade to weapons you've already got. There are two types of currency, these little ninja star coins which you can use to upgrade your character, and the cash which you use for all of these items. You get cash every level, but not enough to buy something every level, so you do have to be a little bit careful with your spending. There are four characters in total, ninja, who you start with right away. No, not, not that ninja, thankfully. You get Lara Craft shortly after, and then the other two are RNG chance to get unlocked. You can switch your character before the start of any floor as well. They all have bonuses, although I'm unsure if the bonuses are things that happen automatically, or if the bonuses are like things you can unlock in the store. For example, the ninja has a shuriken in his unlocks, but I don't have that automatically. If I see it in the store, I still have to buy it. But sometimes I also get things for free, so I don't really know. It's not quite explained. There are cameras and laser grids and passcode locks to get around. I think my best comparison would be kind of like a top-down Sly Cooper. After a while, it stops throwing new stuff at you, but I could see myself being bored on a hot summer day as a kid and just grinding out every single character to see if there's a huge difference or a cool new boss or something. It's not something I would find myself playing now, but it's way more complex and in-depth than almost every other game we've played so far, so to that I give it a lot of credit. Super Goal Super Goal is a fun soccer game, and I call it soccer because that's what we call it in Canada, I'm sorry, but it isn't quite the puzzle game that it wants to be, but I still think it's pretty fun. The objective of the game is to get the ball into the net. You control whichever blue guy has the ball, and if red gets possession at any point or the goalie makes a save, you have to restart that level. The reason I say it's not really a puzzle game is because the physics are really inconsistent, and that alone changes a lot about how you play. There's not really one solution to a level, which I don't think there should be, but I think the game wanted you to do a lot more passing, but you can just keep going for breakaway passes and eventually you'll probably make it. You can just get a really good shot off and the goalie will just rob you. You can get your guy the ball and for some reason he just dribbles for 15 feet before you get control, which makes things way easier. The reason I still like this game is for me the coolest part is just when the player doesn't rotate automatically when receiving the pass. This means that sometimes you'll be facing backwards with your back to the net and you have to pass backwards to someone else to continue to move the play forward, much like you would see in an actual soccer game. I think that's really cool, because it makes me feel like I'm setting up plays. My zone out game when I'm just stressed and need to do something for half an hour is playing the NHL games, and I love trying to make realistic looking plays, passing back to the defense, so this stuff really resonates with me. The game only has 100 levels. It was actually the first game I played on the playables and I finished it in one sitting by accident less than an hour. I would love to see some form of longer version of this where you actually get to play a game and try to make saves and defense, but I know that's way more complicated than just having a guy shoot the ball, but really fun. I like it. Sword play. Hold the sword. That's it. Look, I know we're getting close to the end. I'm not trying to rush things, even though it may seem like it. Legitimately, these games are just a lot shorter. But this one is just holding a sword. You don't even have to swipe. You can just hold it out and stab your enemies and deflect oncoming bullets with little to no problem at all. 
it is somehow more shallow than the crash testing dummy shooting one and that one was so shallow i can't remember what it was called and i can't be bothered to scroll up to find out what it was called i'm gonna go ahead and guess that they probably didn't get the rights to use these swords either which really makes me wonder what the vetting process was for the games is YouTube technically responsible if Square Enix wants these taken down because they were used without permission? I have no idea how any of this works. I don't know what the connection between the game and YouTube and them being a publisher or them just being a platform or any of it is. I'm just thinking out loud, but if you have any theories, I would love to know. Tall Man Run. I, I feel so weird just saying the title of the game like because it I but I don't know what else to do I, I want to say the name of the game but I don't want to start every like paragraph with the name of the game but I feel like an idiot doing it so here's a look into the the psyche and the mind of narrating ghost boy I suppose in this game you run through the blue gates to get taller or wider avoid the red gates to get shorter or thinner and the obstacles which will slice parts of you away and then make it to the end, where you run through gates that slowly drain your height and weight until you are nothing left. If you have enough chunkiness to you, then you'll make it to the end to Karate Kick the Giant Titan, which gives you extra points. The points, much like the points on whose line is it anyways, are useless and don't do anything. Collect them all you want, but there will never be anything to spend them on or a leaderboard, not that YouTube playables are doing real leaderboards anyways, even though they probably could they just simply exist to give you a metric of how well you did on that particular map, but you can also play perfectly and not make it to the end anyway, so it's not like playing perfect is rewarded. It's not like it's a measure of perfect play, it's just a thing that sometimes happens. There's also not really much of a challenge to this game. You aren't continuously running forward, which you think would be the base of the game but you can just stop moving at any time. So if you want to get something specific, you can just stand there and wait. It's another game I would put closely to the oddly satisfying trend, games that don't necessarily have a challenge or a purpose, but sometimes look kind of cool to get your guy super fat and super tall. It's not a game where you're really trying to get a high score or any sort of outcome, but once the satisfying elements wear off and you realize there's really no point in getting a high score or there's no greater outcome to achieve, it's hard to keep playing. Tile Master. It's like the 3D emoji one that we played earlier, but it's not 3D and it has skins for you to choose from, which is really nice. That's literally it. Nothing else to say because we pretty much covered an identical game. Again, not trying to speed through things just because we're close to the end. It's just that it's literally something we've already covered. And it just looks different and it's a little bit easier or maybe harder because you have less tiles. I don't know. Today's Hurdle. This game is Wordle, but with a twist, which I'm not sure the legal ramifications of that twist, but whatever. First, you have to beat a game of Wordle, which is hard enough. Then you play another game, but your starting word is the word you just finished with. They make sure to give you at least one letter, so it's not like you're going in blind and having to look for all five letters, which is fair given you're also down a slot. You do this a few more times and on to the final round, and in the final round, you only get two guesses, and the first four slots are taken by the words you've already gotten right. It's pretty fun. It's more of an intentional puzzle aspect for sure. It doesn't feel as random because they've obviously tried to set you up to succeed by giving you a few letters here and there, and most of the letters for the final hurdle. But if it was completely random, I'm not quite sure it would work as well unless they gave you maybe one or two extra guesses per round. But even then, you could get completely screwed over by RNG if all of your words are the same. But I think that would still be pretty fun and work out fine. It's like an alternative way for those who are still playing Wordle. But let's be real. If you're not playing Octortle, you're not on my level. Tomb of the Mask. Tomb of the Mask is very similar to A Maze. You, you may not remember, it was that game from the very beginning. Uh, we talked about it, it was a long time ago. You have to go around and collect all the things before exiting the cave. Whoever designed this game hates me. 
I am so convinced that whoever made this game intentionally hates people with motion sickness because, oh my god, after three minutes, I had to stop and go lie down. They do this thing where when a menu pops up, everything shakes, and I guess it's supposed to look like a flicker from an old arcade machine or an old TV, but it just destroyed my brain in seconds. It's actually incredible how fast I got a headache from this. Every time you hit a wall, it does a little bounce as well, and then when you have to go really fast, I, I just can't do it. I'm sorry, I've mentioned colorblindness and motion sickness a lot in this video, I a lot in all of my videos, but sometimes it is just brutal and it does prevent me from finishing things. These are the sacrifices I make for you guys, and if only there was some way you could repay me at patreon.com slash reality escape. Trivia crack. It's trivia. I think I used to play an app with the same branding or similar branding. Maybe this is a ripoff. Uh, back in university, you could connect to your friends and challenge them. And they had a lot of generic topics or specific topics like gaming or because we were in film school, we did movies. But this is literally just asking you random questions one by one. And that's it. It's just a quiz. I'm too old to be taking quizzes. Turbo Stars. Turbo Stars is a skateboarding unicycle type game where you race others. Of course, it's not a real race because the CPU start way ahead of you, but the speed is also kind of inconsistent. There's nothing that really tells you what speeds you up or slows you down outside of not crashing. You collect money on the track, which can be used for hundreds of different appearance options, or you can get a one-time boost before a race if you're stuck. But beyond that, after a few maps, the game gets pretty repetitive. Overall, it's pretty easy. It's fun to go fast. It doesn't control super smoothly. There's a little bit of a drift and a little bit of delay when you're trying to move, but I think it's intended, and after a while, it does feel pretty good. I should also specify that I'm not really a racing guy in general, so this kind of game was never going to appeal to me, but this game plays exactly how it looks, and the races aren't all that long, so if you see this and it looks like something you'd like, it is something you would like. Wood, Nuts, and Bolts. I quite like this game. It's fun and challenging and satisfying all at the same time. You have to remove the screw so that the planks of wood fall, and that's basically it. Every level has two different puzzles to it. The first one is generally pretty easy. The second one is super crowded. You have to be careful because if you're releasing the wrong screws, first off, you have to put a screw somewhere to actually release it, and you may cover up the holes with planks and you might end up blocking yourself out of a win. You have a few power-ups at the bottom. You can hit the board to try to knock loose pieces that are just sitting on top of others, although this won't always help, or you can remove an extra screw, technically giving you an extra spot that you weren't intended to solve the puzzle with. You can also undo a move and restart the level, and these cost tickets, which you can buy with gold, which you get for completing levels, but not a lot. You won't have one every single round. My big issue with this game is the fact that every level is two puzzles. You have an easier puzzle, sometimes you have to be a little bit careful with timing but it's not too hard, followed by a much harder one that is more difficult. You can use your tickets, mess up, and then you have to go back and do the first one and you no longer have those tickets and you already know how to do the first one and you probably did it with very little difficulty because it's not that hard. And it's just a waste of like 35 seconds that you shouldn't have to go through. For a game that is a puzzle game, I want to continue to tackle the puzzle again and again until I get it right. And going back to do an easier level first is just an unnecessary delay that really takes me out of it. I'm already frustrated a tiny little bit for not having solved the puzzle on the first try. Now I'm more frustrated because I have to go back and do another puzzle that was really easy first. The other thing is sometimes the physics is just inconsistent and not something you can rely on. Sometimes a piece will lie flat on another piece and stay still, and sometimes it will begin to slide off and you never really know which you're going to get. If you're hoping a piece will slide off and it doesn't, that could cost you your run. Then you have to go back and play the first puzzle again, and if you use a ticket and it costs you your run, well now you don't have that back, so now you're just screwed and you have to figure out a different way to do it. which. I'm not opposed to because it's a puzzle game. There's obviously a way to solve it without that extra screw being gone, but it's just the principle of the thing. 
I know I spent more time complaining than explaining, but I actually do really enjoy the game. I think it's a good level of challenge and trying to figure out the timing and placement of everything. I'm not quite smart enough to consider physics in my puzzles and how the pieces will fall, so I'm quite bad at these games, but I find enjoyment once I actually get to solve them. But when I'm really invested in trying to solve a puzzle and I have to keep going backwards one and playing an easy one, it just reminds me of being a kid and watching the same damn cutscenes over and over again when I was trying to beat a boss. Words of Wonders I used to play this game quite a bit, I think I had an app for it. You get a wheel and you just need to make as many words you can out of the wheel of words and there's a crossword that kind of gives you hints if you get stuck. I used to try and convince myself that Somehow playing this would make me a better writer by knowing more words with three or four letters in them, but it really did nothing for me. Maybe it subconsciously helped me my Wordle game out. What's really cool about this game is that you can also play in other languages. So if you're perhaps learning French, you can try to do that. The downside is that you can't start at an easier level if you've already been playing in English or whatever other language. So you'll have to make a new account or have a separate one if you want to start from the beginning. If they modified it so that you could have multiple games at different languages and maybe if you clicked on something you could have a word definition or a translation, this could be a fantastic tool for those trying to learn a new tongue. It still could be, but I think it would need some modifications and also I don't think that was the point of the game. But if perhaps you're learning English and you're trying to figure stuff out, then this could be a good tool for you. Words of Wonders Guru. It's almost exactly the same thing, but you get a different set of letters for each word and it gives you a hint as to which word you're looking for. It's a little bit easier. It might actually be more useful to help someone learn a language because it has a definition, but the definition would be in the language you don't aren't super familiar with, so that might not help you a ton. Also, I put a different word first because I just noticed it and I immediately broke the game. So that's cool. Zoo Happy Animals. It is very funny that this game is the final one on the list because it's last because it's last alphabetically, but it's also an amalgamation of every game we've played so far. The best way I can describe it is it's like flash game WarioWare. A lot of the same concepts we've seen for entire games are reused here for just a single level. And I'm gonna be honest, this game is like a fever dream. Actually, it's like several fever dreams. Everyone looks out of their mind. People are getting eaten. There's a fun mode that just makes the screen go upside down. If you have a kid who likes to play weird, wacky games and maybe they're not super well-versed in gaming, they will love this, I promise. It doesn't necessarily do anything great, and maybe it gets harder as the game goes on, but I don't think it was meant to be any sort of challenge. It's just wacky, good fun, and for some reason you can also play Fruit Ninja. YouTube playables are such an interesting addition that I can't say I understand the immediate impact of. It's very possible that this is just getting their foot in the door, or trying to continue to dominate the already devastating chokehold they have on web and app duration times, which I'm sure helps sell ads. Or maybe they were all really cheap acquisitions and they really just thought, eh, why not, and decided to add them. The lack of fanfare or huge announcement is equally as puzzling as I didn't see a single person on any timeline of mine talking about these. I had to discover them all on my own. So it's not like YouTube is overly pushing these as a selling point. They're not telling creators to tell people about them. I think the target audience is pretty obvious. It's kids. It's kids who already own phones when they're probably a little bit too young to have one or the kids who are asking their parents if they can play games on their phone. And now, without downloading a new app, you have over 90 games at your disposal. And while an overwhelming majority of them lack any sort of depth, sometimes you don't need that. You just want to play whatever, do something with your hands, and this is more than enough. And if we are talking about kids, then 
Their attention spans are very weird. They can get hooked by the simplest of things. But there's also some more complex games and hidden gems in here. And I think maybe the collection would have benefited from a more organized system. Perhaps two sections, one for kids and one for, well not adults, but older kids. Although this would lead YouTube to admit that there's a lot of kids on their website who are not exclusive to YouTube kids and I'm not sure they want to do that. It's a real shame that some of these games presumably, or should I say hopefully, weren't properly vetted and most likely just added as a giant bundle because there are so many low quality experiences in here that all it does is lower the overall quality of the concept. If you started with Zoo Happy Animals or Phone Case DIY or My Space Pet, there's a good chance you'd probably give up pretty fast and miss out on Cards of the Undead or Cube Tower or Merge Pirates, games that clearly had inspiration and design philosophies and things that they were trying to achieve behind them. Starting off with 10 high quality games would have been much stronger than 90 games where there's so many things you play for 5 minutes and get bored, but maybe the intention was always just to have a giant library and not really care too much about how much people were actually enjoying it. And they're still adding games. Literally while writing this closing segment, two games were added. One called Polysphere where you have to move all the particles around to find the image. It's really cool, the art looks great. It's more on the interactive experience zen game genre than game, but I think it looks nice. And Sushi Grab, which is a claw machine type game where you need to grab food on a conveyor belt. But now, they're in a very diluted pool and will be harder to find because they really needed to have lunchbox ready. And again, it goes back to the conversation about clearly labeling some games for a younger audience and some for a mature audience. This way people can have some sort of expectations going in and parents can know exactly what games would be the best to give their kids if they just need a couple minutes to breathe. Or maybe kids aren't the target audience at all, in which case I think they've not only completely missed the boat, I think they've dove headfirst into the water and hit the ocean floor. There are so many games you could play on your phone or on a tablet or at your PC that these concepts simply do not hold up. 15 years ago? Amazing, a collection of some of the most iconic mobile game franchises to ever exist. Now, a nice little nostalgic collection, probably better left untouched. There's also the case of some of these incompleted versions of games. I'm not opposed to having games that have endings, but some of these are clearly not finished or have updated versions already floating around and YouTube has given versions that essentially feel like extended demos. So will YouTube be updating these games or will we always have these base builds? If we don't get a more complete version of the game and people don't seek out a full version of their own, it really feels like a disservice to the developer who wanted to expand on what they've already built. And even worse, if you've already put a few hours into a game like My Perfect Hotel and then realize there's a fuller version out there but now you have to start over, well, sometimes it's easier to shrug and say never mind. Not to mention that there's no ads in these games, so none of the developers are actively making money off of it. I don't like ads, but I also understand that developers need slash want to get paid. So I'm not totally against them, it's a complex conversation. Along with incomplete versions of games, there's the fact that so many of their games are clearly intended to be multiplayer, but YouTube does not have this function. Now, I'm not saying they should. I actually think there are plenty of arguments for why they shouldn't. But so many of these games just fall flat without that element that it makes me wonder what the reasoning was to put them in at all. Some of these games work fine with bots, but some of them really need a multiplayer function or else they lose all charm. Was I expecting 95 star games, the best of mobile apps, the next indie game hidden gem? No, of course not. Expectations were very low and I'm honestly not even sure if they've been met. Right now playables are so new and in such a weird state that it's very possible we have 200 games by this time next year and it's somehow also possible that we have less or none at all. 
It's very nice to play these games without being hounded by the ads, but the question that remains is, is this the direction YouTube should be going? The obvious answer from a business perspective is yes, step into any market you can and slowly take over the world. Why should you ever allow people to leave your website? And to the people who feel like YouTube has other major problems to deal with and they shouldn't be focused on playables, playables are clearly not a priority and I can safely bet that the team behind them are not the same as the ones who are behind the copyright system, the algorithm, and the rampant bots that comment on every video. So before people start leaving comments like, is this really their main focus? It's not the same team. Is YouTube trying to become a gaming platform? I don't think any of us are thinking it will rival Steam or Epic or whatever the heck Ubisoft is up to now, but it could be the replacement of addicting games, mini clips, one more level, cool math games, websites that were either wiped out by the death of Flash or the accessibility of modern gaming. Because that's kind of what we just experienced. If you're from a younger generation, you may not be able to relate to this as much, but for people like myself who will be in their mid-30s by the time this decade is over, I can remember so clearly going on websites like Newgrounds or Cool Math Games, and sometimes you're just scrolling through endless games and you find one that you think looks cool. And sometimes you find some real stinkers, games that may well have just been a school coding project or someone self-teaching themselves. Something just to show you that they have the knowledge but lacking real substance or depth or a reason to play. But sometimes you find those hidden gems, the games that had complex mechanics, the games that had the levels to grind, story to experience, high scores that you actually wanted to try and beat. That's why we went through those long journeys on those websites. Those were the games we were looking for that made it all worth it. I think YouTube is trying to become the new version of this site, a site parents can trust that their kids can go on. It's a familiar name, no online play, and they can sift through piles of games to find the diamonds in the rough. And I think YouTube will succeed. I think as playables continue, they will acquire more and more games, maybe bigger games, games we find ourselves actively wanting to play, especially if they lean into the idle game. And maybe one day we'll see a YouTube playables original. I don't think it's that crazy of an idea. It's something I'm eager to keep an eye on, but overall what we have right now is exactly what we see ideas, concepts, not very strong in execution, but a lot of room to get better. When I heard about playables, I thought maybe it was going to be a way to game while watching videos at the same time, really bring those TikToks with gameplay on the bottom and substance on the top to life. I'm actually glad that's not what it turned out to be. I think it's a feature that might as well exist, it'll probably happen sooner than later, and I'm kind of hoping it doesn't, but at the same time, let's be honest, most of us who are watching this video right now have it open on a second monitor while you're doing something else anyways. Media landscapes are ever growing, ever changing, and companies are always looking for the next big thing. YouTube playables 10 years ago would have seemed like an odd idea, but would have been a massive hit. Now, it's probably a good idea, but also a bit of a miss. But also it makes perfect sense. The only thing left to see is, where is this all going to go? So are YouTube playables worth playing right now? No, I don't think so. At least not for me. But will they be? Well, that's a more interesting question. And for that one, we'll just have to wait and see.